This item is item number 15, application for a certificate of appropriateness, Borough of Manhattan, uh, docket number 16, 1604, it's 1010 Park Avenue, aka 1010-1012 Park Avenue, Park Avenue Historic District. Uh, an application for a certificate of appropriateness. It's an annex to a Gothic revival style church designed by Merrill and Horngren and built in 1960. The application is to demolish the building and construct a new building. It's zoned R10 R8B. Good afternoon, Commissioners. William Neely with the Landmark Preservation Commission staff. 1010 Park Avenue is located at the southwest corner of Park Avenue and East 85th Street in the Park Avenue Historic District. The site consists of a Gothic Revival style church constructed in 1909-11 and an annex constructed in 1960-63. The proposal is to demolish the annex and construct a new residential building, which will also provide space for the church. Paul Selver with Kramer, Levin, Mathalos, and Frankel will introduce the project. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, as Bill said, Paul Selver with Kramer, Levin, Mathalos, and Frankel, and we are counsel to the Park Avenue Christian Church. Let's come out this time. Okay. Uh, this certificate of appropriateness application seeks to replace the annex, one of the two buildings <coughs> on the church's property at 1010 Park Avenue, with a mixed use building containing useful space for the church and apartments. Approval of the certificate of appropriateness and implementation of the proposed development will give the church the resources it desperately needs to stabilize and begin restoration of its sanctuary and to establish an endowment 
that both will fund the preservation of the sanctuary and uh, ensure that the church has the resources to carry out its mission for generations to come. Pastor Alvin Jackson will speak after me and he'll talk about these issues. The Park Avenue Historic District Designation Report recognizes that this lot is improved with two different buildings. One is the sanctuary designed by Cram, Good, Hugh, and Ferguson and completed in 1911. No one doubts that the sanctuary is of landmark quality. The second is the annex. The annex is not historic. It replaced the original Cram, Good, Hugh, and Ferguson composition consisting of a rectory and a parish house separated by a courtyard in 1963. Bayer Bell will describe in detail the makeover of the annex site a makeover that included the virtually complete demolition of both the rectory and the parish house, the obliteration of the former site plan by the annex, and the construction of a pedestrian six-story building clad primarily in yellow brick and covering almost its entire footprint lot. Any attempt to characterize this makeover as a modest intervention is rhetorical sophistry, plain and simple. It cannot change what actually occurred in 1963, nor can it change the fact that the annex is, for all intents and purposes, a 1963 building that lacks historic integrity. It is this absence of historic integrity that was the reason the Landmark Preservation Commission concluded when it designated this district that the annex is a no-style building that does not contribute to the historic district. It was the right conclusion when it was made, and no one has offered a basis for disturbing that conclusion since. Now, some people have sought to second-guess the Commission's decision by claiming that the annex is deemed to contribute to the National Register's Park Avenue Historic District. This claim appears to be based on the description of the annex in the nomination form that includes reference to a, and I'll quote, C or circa 1960s two-story red brick penthouse at the rear building, end quote. However, this description omits any reference to the demolition of the original parish house and rectory. It does not identify the annex as architect. It incorporates an incorrect brick color, and it is a clear understatement of both the scope and character of the work that was actually undertaken. Given its factually incorrect premise, it should not take precedence over the Commission's carefully considered determination that this is a no-style building. Bayer Blinder Bell will also present the building that is proposed in the annex site, a building that in its massing, height, facade pattern, facade materials, <coughs> and window type reprises the fabric of the historic district and contributes to its sense of place with a 21st century take on the apartment buildings that gave that give the district its character. And finally, I, I want to address two issues that you can expect will be raised by the application's opponents. The first is that the church should be required to use the proceeds of the transaction exclusively for the preservation of the sanctuary. <coughs> to hear this today is profoundly troubling because it means that uh, the people who are saying it have chosen not to listen to what the church has been saying. The church has made it crystal clear in both oral and written statements that it will be using the funds it gets for both the stabilization and restoration of the building and for establishing an endowment that will be used precisely for the purpose of preserving the sanctuary in addition to the work that it's going to be doing on its missions. The second issue is the suggestion that the church should be seeking hardship relief rather than a certificate of appropriateness. This suggestion twists the church's stated need for the redevelopment of the annex site as a funding mechanism for the preservation of the sanctuary and the maintenance of its mission into a reason for the commission to deny this application. We believe this suggestion is misguided. The hardship provisions of the landmarks law are applicable only to an alteration or demolition that the commission has found to be not appropriate. Here, the Commission has already found that the 1963 annex does not have a style and accordingly does not contribute to the historic district. And Bayer Blinder Bell will show, we believe, that the proposed new building is also appropriate. 
We ask that the commission re also recognize that there is a broader public policy issue at stake here. Churches in general, and this one in particular, are very expensive to maintain. The cost of this maintenance is even higher when the church is landmarked, and congregations are hard pressed to come up with the required funds. This church is no exception. And that is why the church, after many years of struggling to maintain its landmark sanctuary, decided in 2011 that it had no choice but to consider the redevelopment of its property. To that end, it began examining redevelopment opportunities all prior to the desert calendaring and designation of the historic district. It made, in doing this, it made a responsible decision that the demolition of the 1963 annex and the development of the new building would allow it to meet the dual goal of preserving the church and preserving the sanctuary. It further recognized the importance of preservation by voluntarily putting its development plans on hold when the historic district was calendared and by supporting its designation. So even though this is not a hardship application, the financial issues that have been raised are relevant to the Commission's consideration because they are critical to the Commission's understanding of the proposed development. What we are asking today is that the Commission find that the development is appropriate. And for the Church, anything less would neither meet its very real needs nor allow it to maintain the one truly worthy building on its site. In the end, the choice is a simple one. The Commission can vote to keep a 1960s building that it has already determined does not contribute to the character of the district. The risk is that in doing so, the city could lose an institution and it could lose the sanctuary as a building. Or the Commission can vote in favor of the church's application. Doing so would replace the annex with a Park Avenue Historic District appropriate building. It would breathe new life into the church as an institution and it would fund immediate work on the sanctuary and an endowment to support its maintenance in the future. Preservation values are not served by empty and lifeless buildings, nor are they served where there is no choice but to allow a building to decay beyond repair. There is no reason here to risk either outcome when the alternative that offers both a, when there is an alternative that offers both a new building, that contributes to the historic district, and the preservation of the one true landmark on this site. Thank you. And now, Pastor Jackson will speak. <coughs> Madam Chair, members of the Commission, I'm Alvin Jackson, pastor of Park Avenue Christian Church. April 2011, the governing board of the church made a decision to pursue the development of the site of our 1963 Annex Building. It has been a long and circuitous course to this moment. 2004 years, 204 years, Park Avenue Christian Church has been a part of the religious and cultural fabric of New York City. And since April 1945, on the corner of 85th and Park Avenue, we've become one of the most diverse congregations in the city, ethnic, economic, faith, geography, with members living in all five boroughs of the city. We are a relatively small congregation of about 225 members, and we are not wealthy. Many educators, artists, dreamers, middle class, with very limited means. We are a progressive congregation, and see service for others as a hallmark of who we are. Our open and affirming stands of welcoming same-sex couples and celebrating marriages in our sanctuary a Saturday community lunch program for the homeless, immigration clinics for new immigrants to this country, water wells in Haiti, just to mention a few. And, and we've enjoyed a 25-year relationship, partnership with the Temple of Universal Judaism that also shares our space. You will hear this afternoon from my friend, the rabbi, shortly. We've struggled for many years to balance our mission with the maintenance of our building, including the expenditure of hundreds of thousands of dollars annually to, uh, to ensuring that the sanctuary continues to be usable. However, we've reluctantly concluded that it's impossible for a congregation of our size in today's economy in this city 
to maintain the great treasure of the 1911 historic landmark building and remain a vital living institution that impacts the community. This development project gives us the opportunity to do the deferred maintenance and restoration needed. The sanctuary looks good, but much work is needed. 1982, 32 years ago, was the last time the church was in a position to do any major restoration and repairs to the sanctuary. Working with Jones Lane, LaSalle, Costal Greenwood architects, the church has determined that around $2 million in restoration is immediately needed, which would include stained glass, ceiling, floor, facade repair, slate roof tile replacement, crumbling masonry, and water leaks in the north wall of the church. Other future repairs and upgrades, including organ repair and new lighting, will be no less than $3 million and very likely as high as $4 million. The church is committed to using the funds it receives from this development to do the needed repairs and establish an endowment with permanent funds using only the interest. This project then would give the church a new building for church and community use. It would breathe new life into the church's capacity to carry out its mission, and it would enable the congregation to prepare a significant landmark structure in the Park Avenue Historic District and to maintain and preserve it for years to come. Letters of support from clergy and community leaders will be presented to the staff by Melissa Little from the church. A long, circuitous course, but we dare to hope, Madam Chair and members of the commission, that you would look favorably on our application for a certificate of appropriateness. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. My name is John Byer, I'm with Byer Blinder Bell Architects. <clears throat> Michael Whetstone is here to join me uh, as the de design partner on the project to take you through our proposal and analysis for this very, very important site. First of all, I know that you're all familiar with this location and we wanted to just give you a reminder of how important this corner of Park Avenue and 85th Street is with the church itself, the annex, and then the uh, 1000 Park Avenue rounding out the Park Avenue facade uh, in this block. Here we have the church. This is the annex, as you just heard, was built in 1963, except for this fragment. This is 1000 Park Avenue, a very distinguished building. We'll talk to you more about that. And we're seeing very characteristically a microcosm of this amazing historic Park Avenue district. What we have are pre-war buildings, with, often with penthouses set back. We have post-war buildings with often setbacks exceeding the, uh, the ones of the pre-war, both representing classic street wall designs. Contrasting that, we have a number of community facilities, civic buildings, institutions, such as the church and St. Ignatius Loyola. We're on this sidewalk looking at the building from 85th and Park. Here is the church with its distinguished Gothic Revival style, buttresses that climbs right from the sidewalk up to the cornice line. A magnificent Tiffany stained glass window, and our Emory Roth building rounding out the block. You we see here the church, the fragment of the existing, only existing remaining piece of the, of the rectory, and then the 1963 um, infill, and behind it an even larger uh, yellow brick structure. So this is a piece of history, everything else is not. The sanctuary was inspired by Saint-Chapelle in Paris and remains one of the great accomplishments of Gothic Revival architecture in New York. Uh, this is a view of a Guastavino tiled uh, attic, arches, 
giving it another distinction with another great <clears throat> architect contributing to this important monument. These are two side views of the edge of the church uh, here on the left looking at a, an alley that exists between the 1963 building and the church and then this is the opposite with the church on the right and you see the alley which permits a certain amount of light to come into the stained glass windows on the side. The architects around us here are significant New York contributors to your landmark collection of buildings. Uh, Cram Goodhue Ferguson, many, many buildings, many of them the, on the east side, some of them in this district. In addition, we have Emery Roth, who is known for his flamboyant architecture on the west side, where he was very, very conscious of the stenographic position across Central Park of these magnificent towers. But he was also very contextual in many, much of his work, either on uh, 82nd Street with a very simple, very clear classical building, but also next to us at 100, 1000 Park Avenue, he was a little bit more modernistic. He was inspired in our judgment by the treatment of vertical piers being inspired by the church um, buttresses with a single material brick rising from the, the street to the cornice and band courses that were highlighted with terracotta. This illustrates the original rectory building and the church in the campus that was created by two separate structures and a courtyard. That was in 1950, that was really 19, uh, um, around 1911, that 1915 isn't quite right. In, in 1963, except for this fragment, the entire campus next to the church was demolished, rebuilt for the purposes of an expansion of the church services. When we attended the <coughs> designation hearing, but there was a lot of discussion about the issue of this fragment. And we knew that there were commissioners that were concerned about it or interested in the subject. So when we looked at how to approach the design of a new building on this site, which is permitted by the, by the landmark's decision to call what is left of, this, of, the, of, of the 1963 annex as a non-contributing building, permitting us to propose a new building. However, there was talk about the possibility of incorporating the fragment into a new building. So we really had two choices. One would be what we're proposing, and you saw it on the, in the beginning slide, to build a street wall building to not keep the, uh, the fragment or any other part of the 1963 building, but build a classic, straightforward street wall building complying with the, with the zoning and the landmark uh, uh, policies of that as a characteristic important way to design buildings on Park Avenue, unless they're civic, special, institutional buildings, which I described before. However, we did look at what a fragment might, how a fragment might be incorporated into the facade of a new building. Although we don't have a drawing of it, the reason we looked at it is because there was some concern about it. And as a valid concern needs a valid response. The only way in our judgment that one could <coughs> imagine retaining this fragment would be to have the tower set back from the street. One could not envision the fragment being at, at flush with a new building on Park Avenue. That would be unacceptable to the, this body, I would assume, because that would be a fake way to preserve something. And it would also be confusing to the public as to what was original and what is new. So if one were to set the building back, it would mean that we would not have a street wall building. And what would you have? You have essentially 
you would have a freestanding fragment with nothing authentic behind it because there is no existing structure from the original behind it. So what would a fragment be if, if it were freestanding and a tower set behind it? We felt that it was more important, and we made a judgment about a trade-off, more important to build a, a, an appropriate street wall building than to retain a piece of, of a historic building that would require setting back and not having a street wall, which to us wasn't justifiable as a design or a, a, even a preservation policy. So moving ahead, we're proposing to create a new building and not to keep anything that's remaining of the original, nor anything on the 1963 building. This is a quick illustration of the original elevation with the sanctuary, the fragment that I'm talking about remaining. This was what was originally in the area where that was replaced, which is the yellow zone is what was created behind the gable end piece. And you can see the fenestration is different, the entrances are different, the brickwork is, and, and I mean the stone is different, it's a different color. So that is where we are now going to embark on our proposal. The site of the annex is shown in the hatch tone, which we intend to remove. This is a plan, 85th Street, Park Avenue. <clears throat> These are two sections. The sanctuary, of course, is here. Next, <coughs> our site plan constructs a building 45 feet along Park Avenue, 100 feet and 133 feet deep. We have a deep site permitting a very large 33 foot, four inch rear yard. The existing building occupies the entire site. So we're able to create a courtyard that permits light to come into the apse, which, which, um, which the, pre the, the, build, the present building doesn't permit. We have a setback on Park Avenue at the 14th floor, which is exactly what most of the uh, pre-war buildings have had of 10 feet, and a further setback at the corner, you'll see that. And we have a skylighted um, a light court, which permits light to come into the stained glass, and which will be supplemented with artificial light. We looked at the Park Avenue uh, east and west facades from 79th Street to, eight, uh, to 91st Street. Why? Because one of the things that's characteristic of all of Park Avenue, in addition to the street wall, which is consistently represented by all the buildings, pre-war, post-war, are the variety of the ways by which the buildings terminate. And pre-war buildings, as well as post-war buildings, often had setback penthouses in various ways and locations. And post-war buildings had more of them. And often they were not set back at the 14th floor. This incidentally, we can blow this up, Michael, is where we are. This is the church. This is Emory Roth. This is BBB. This is St. Ignatius. And we are suggesting that our building strike a strong line at the 14th floor and has an addition of two floors which is characteristic of many other buildings in the district, which I'll show you more of now. These are two um, characteristic <coughs> pre-war buildings on Park Avenue, 90th, 89th, uh, and 89th, with setbacks at the 14th floor, and then addition, I mean a street wall to 14th floor, and then setbacks above it, and these are post-war buildings that exceed the, um, the, the, the 14th floor uh, setback, because it wasn't required at the time, and have setbacks above uh, various levels, all of which are contributing. Next. This shows two <coughs> types of buildings that we feel are characteristic as well, that are below 
um, in, uh, in Lower um, Park Avenue, historic pre-war buildings with additions and setbacks above it. And there are also two significant limestone buildings, which we feel is an appropriate material for our proposed new building that exists, one on 76th Street and one on 71st Street, that um, are characteristically limestone from top to bottom. So our proposal, there are a number of principles that we have established in the design of this building that come from what we have just seen, the analysis and the context of what this building represents in this important part of Park Avenue. The first thing, we've said it a couple of times, is the street wall. The street wall is absolutely, in our judgment, mandatory for this site and any site that isn't in itself a landmark or could be a new building that could be a landmark. But this gives you the sense of the rhythm of the street wall buildings and those beautiful historic institutional buildings. You see the setbacks. This is a pre-war building with a setback. This is now our building with a setback at the upper level. The second thing is the, the neutral palette. We are mediating in, with our design between two very significantly different material, materiality aspects of the block. Very, very heavily rusticated Manhattan schist granite and highly textured a buff brick that is quite um, vibrant. And that material goes from top to bottom on the our neighbor. This material goes from top to bottom on, in the church with, a, with some limestone trim. And we're proposing a limestone building, top to bottom, ground up, to be in context with our neighbors, which would not be characteristic of another block where you might have mixed materials. The other principles are that we're, we're talking about a modern design, a modern building that is clearly differentiated from a historicized building, that there's no confusion that this is a contemporary building. We have punch windows, as our neighbors have, but they're larger. They're larger and wider because we feel it's appropriate for that expression in a modern building as opposed to being confused with a historicized building. We have a strong verticality, which is picked up from our neighbors. That verticality is expressed by a shadow casting pilaster, which is facing east, so it picks up the sun, so it, as the shadows are cast on our neighbors, it also will be a rhythm on our building. Whereas on, this, on the north facade, which doesn't have the sun, we do not have the deep recess. It's not with a highly uh, modeled facade because we wanted it to be a neutral backdrop to the church. We are turning the corner on a mid-block, on our lot, because it's one lot, and therefore, instead of having a lot line facade, we have a facade that is actually a finished facade. And it's finished in limestone, and we feel it works as a backdrop to the church. Moving along. At the street level, you pick up another important principle of our design, which is band coursing and horizontal lines that are expressed subtly, not boldly or kind of uh, classically, because we didn't feel that was appropriate for a modern structure, but enough visually to connect the horizontality of our neighbor's band courses with our own, as well as the strong, powerful band course in the monumental entrance of the church. Next. I'll go through the, a little bit more quickly the, all the architectural drawings. If you want to interrupt, I'd be happy to have you do so. We're looking at the 85th Street here, our neighbor on 1020 Park to the north, to the, to the north, the church, our proposed building, and Emory Roth. You're seeing the idea of the band courses coming across. You see them occurring at this point here. This is where our setback starts, slightly below the setback of the 14th floor at 1000 Park Avenue. We set back, and then we continue to have band courses carrying vertically, and you can see the contrast between our relationship to the Emory Roth building versus what is the very large, inappropriate windows, however, in a contributing building, that we have in a post-war 
design on uh, 1020 Park next. The north elevation has a, has a neutral backdrop we feel is extremely important for the, instead of a, of a, of a lot line design. The, the design is in limestone, and this is the Regis School, all in limestone, which is a nice relationship because we're, we're, we're bookending the, the church on two sides with limestone as a neutral foil to the rusticated granite. And then also the picking up the idea of a two-story vertical expression on the top of the building is somewhat inspired by Regis. Street level views existing. We're standing at 85th, looking south Westerly, the church, 1020 Park, 1000 Park. Here's the church and our building turning the corner, not on the corner, but turning the corner so the church can read against a neutral backdrop. We're looking now from the north and um, you see the 1020, the church, our building as a continuation of the street wall of 1000 Park Avenue. Next, moving around from different angles, we're a little bit closer, and you see the relationship now of what is a important element of stepping. We think the stepping arrangement of the vertical buttresses of the church, relating to the step relationship of the vertical bands, of the piers of our proposed building, terminating in a kind of an abstract interpretation of buttresses, so this stepping is a complementary relationship, we think, between our building and the church. This is a view um, from 85th Street, which um, is very heavily treed and probably not uh, as visible uh, in, in the summer, but it has this relationship of the church again stepping from the step buttressing to the building. Uh, the, the, the street level uh, view, we have a the van coursing, the fabric awning at the at the entrance, which is a characteristic modest entrance expression on Park Avenue. Next. Here's a elevation, a view. Very important in our judgment to keep this building at the street level, extremely sort of unseen hand that you're just continuing to feel the rhythm of the masonry as you move along Park Avenue. The van course, the canopy, the bronze surround, the, uh, uh, the bronze and glass lighting, uh, and the very, very clear relationship of being between a rusticated stone and a kind of rusticated brick. A little bit more about the top, how it sets back, that we have the limestone extending to a point where this is the cornice line uh, set back at 10 feet, a notch in the corner which further emphasizes that element of the building, terracotta at the top, and then limestone hiding the very large mechanical equipment that we must have because we're not only serving our building, a residential building, we're serving the entire church complex with a whole new mechanical system. Next. The detail of that the window, the idea of the pier um, along, um, uh, along Park Avenue with a uh, shadow casting technique. Uh, these, this is a gray, slimline, win uh, paint gray, color slimline window, so it's, it's a little bit like uh, steel replacement windows in profile. Next. Um, it's just sections that show the, the building on the, uh, on the west elevation uh, and then the south elevation. The courtyard that we're creating, these are two views looking at the um, um, north and west elevation, closer in north and west elevation. The, the courtyard and the permission, the ability to have light coming into the, uh, the windows on the apse and then the skylight over these uh, sky, uh, the light well for the uh, stained glass windows. Next. Excuse me. You see that we're May I ask a question? A quick question. Are are there any images? Hi. Hi. Um, of the 1915 or previous 1960 rectory building in your presentation? Because I don't see them in the packet. Page 
Is it in here? So can you send me to them? Yeah. I don't, for some reason I don't know. Um, everything that... This is the only one? This little one? Yeah, you got a ton of them. How? Um, the, um, the picture, do you mean the one in the back, or? From the street, from Where Park Avenue. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Done. Okay. Yes, page, page nine, uh, on the left side, shows uh, two photographs of the 1950s. Let's just do that first, and then get that straight. Do you have it? This is, this is the only image, is yeah. that right? Thank you. Dan it? Yeah, it is about the light wall. Uh, how, how, um, how wide is the light? It's eight feet ten inches to the glass. Thank you. Okay, here it is. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a, a bit, a, a story about the skylight. But first, you can see that we're building a significant um, cellar for uh, support systems and church activities. This is the the ground floor. And next, we want to talk to you about the light well. This is a very important and sensitive element of the design. You can see in the elevation, uh, in, the, in, the, in the rendering, that this piece of the, of the bill of the church exists. And this piece of the church is salvaged stone from the fragment of the remaining original fabric. That separates our limestone building from the church Manhattan schist. If you look at the section, you can see that the skylight goes from the, the length of the eave line of the church to the facade which is in the stone, and that the red line represents the original profile, the current profile, of the rectory to be removed so that this piece of what is the uh, scar tissue, let's call it, from the church is not stone. So we are conclosing all of that in skylight to permit light to come into the alley between our building and the church, very similar to what's there today. And that's a section through it. Yes, this is the skylight. You got a dimension there of eight foot ten inches from your glass, the old glass to your building. Yes. What was the dimension above the first floor in the in the current condition? Michael. Uh, I'm Michael Wetson from Fire Under Bell. Uh, the current light well is wider. It's about uh, twelve feet, and it's going down to eight feet. Thanks. It's a four foot one story quarter. Just check. Thank you. You can see that the, the skylight is at this point, so it is actually enclosing and protecting the glass. It will have artificial lighting against this wall, so that there will be light during the day coming in both sides. Okay. okay. Yeah, Dana. I was just going to say you you say yeah. that it's. Mike, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, you say that uh, you're separating uh, the church from the building with uh, this. Skylight. Some of the remnants, the uh, skylight. But to me, because it's not transparent, it actually appears as though the church is, a piece of it is now abutting the building. I realize it's not actually the original church, but I wondered if you considered actually having it be more transparent to create more of a, a separation there. I realize you might be able to see some of the, as you called it, scar tissue, but... Do you mean transparent here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we certainly looked at that, mm -hmm. but we felt... A, because the, the, the piece of wall of the church that's always been covered would be exposed mm -hmm. to view, and, it, and it, isn't, it, it isn't a finished stone, we thought that would be inappropriate to look at that. And secondly, we, we thought it would call attention to itself as a, 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 as a modern intervention that might actually be disturbing to see, to see that next to the, between the two buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving along, because I know we have many people we have a, speaking. Yes, we do. Yeah, we have really many people here, too. So if you can just uh, very quickly go through the rest. I, I, I will now go even quicker. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, the courtyard that permits light coming into the apse. Next. A buff-colored brick on the rear facade. Not limestone. Moving on. The windows, the windows are proportioned in the same 
way that our neighbor's buildings are, in other words, this proportion, but they are bigger. They're six feet wide and eight feet four inches high. Next. The materials we have at the top, we have terracotta, which is the material on our neighbor's building, 1000 Park Avenue. We have, that's here. Then we have Indiana limestone, a bit of granite at the very base, a complementary brick to the limestone on the rear facades, a clear glass with low E coating, um, gray metal windows, and a dark oil rub bronze ground floor doors and windows. This is the last piece of our presentation, which is the proposal for an ADA entrance on 85th Street at this point. We are locating it here because it's closer to the main entrance and not here, although this is that grade, because this goes into a, the, um, the, um, the, the back of the church, it's the back door, and it's not in the spirit of the ADA uh, program to go into the back door, and it also goes into the back of the sanctuary. Next. So that we're proposing to actually uh, introduce the door into a uh, interrupted band course on the side of the building at this location. Next. And then I guess lastly is just a, um, a, a summary of the programmatic aspects of the building, the, the, uh, the large mechanical equipment, the residential portion, and then the church facilities. Next. And the ground floor having an entrance for three functions. The church function here, the residential lobby here, and service functions at this point. That concludes our presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, are there questions? Uh, yes, Eddie. I have another question. Do you mind going to slide eight for a moment, please? Slide eight, please, for a moment. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just want some clarification on, on the point that you made about the fragment. Are you saying that you think that, that the fragment is only the facade itself and not its roof nothing, element? Nothing but the facade. It's, the, it's that thing. Right. So, so its roof, that fragment's roof, the, the little kind of dormer roof, we could say, that the, that the fragment had. Are you saying that that's not original not either? Not so that's not even 1930. Everything you're looking at in yellow is 1963. Despite the fact, so I'm looking at the photograph. So go to page nine for a moment. Just go to yeah, nine. So in that photograph up there, the 1930 photograph, 30, whichever it is, that roof, was is, removed. Was removed. Mm -hmm. Everything behind this um, um, gable end stone was removed. Because that was, we have the drawings, we did the inspection, we said, how could they do that? How, how did they do that? They had to prop it up. Because they were rebuilding a completely new building in fireproof construction. This was just a, uh, you know, a small residential facility. Fireproof construction large beams, and, and they, they, made, they made an effort to create something like the original yeah. Park Avenue. They, they made an effort, they did. which is that. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not original, it's not authentic. Uh, Michael and then uh, Chris. Sorry. Um, how wide is the frat? 45 feet. No, no, oh, the, no, the, the, the that's a small piece. I would say it's, what do you think it is? 21 feet. 21 feet. Uh, yes, Chris. How does the height of your proposed building compare to the taller buildings on the west side of uh, Park Avenue? On the west side of Park Avenue? Let's there was look one, at that. One, one is visible. visible. I think we need an elevation. Next. This, this elevation, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and one uh, of the uh, shots that you can see the, a building on about 82nd Street. This is Street. at the, at the um, I would say the 17th, maybe the 17th floor. This is the setback, the first setback on this building is there. Our I just mean the height of the building compared to some of the well, taller buildings. Well, the height of the building is close because... On Park Avenue, they're, they're in I'm one of your views, in the other direction. on Park Avenue, there's a building on about 82nd Street. Okay, we've got to go to the larger... So I just wanted to the, the get a sense right, okay. of which one is it. Which 
Do you have a street view? 80 what? It looked like 80 seconds. So this is this is 85. This this one? Is that in our blow up mic? We have a blow up of this. There was a view that you had of go looking down Park Avenue. I just want to you know, oh. is it the tallest building on Park Avenue? Right here. Yeah. Well, what's the comparison? Is it, do you know what um, I meant? Right, yeah. <laughs> this, right, this line right here is about 14 stories, which is that and which is that. That line is about 14 stories. So this is two stories above. I'm two talking four. about the the highest point of the new building compared. Is it the tallest building on Park Avenue? No. I guess that's no. the question. Is it the yeah. tallest building? I, I mean, I can, that's all. I can answer the, uh, the, the, the buildings, for example, that you see uh, between 85th and 86th, those, those go to the zoning height limit of 210 feet plus a bulkhead head on top. And our building is lower than that. Our building is 182 feet high plus Thank the you. bulkhead. And then the street wall buildings are generally around 150 to 160. Uh, Diana? Yeah, that Chris had one of my questions, which is generally why it's taller than the building adjacent, but uh, to just to go to a different issue, which is it's really, the building really does present as a, a corner building, uh, and you spoke of it as being uh, sort of a, a, a neutral backdrop to the church. Yes. It seems to me, while the, the you know, material and so forth and the color may be, that it, 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 it's presenting itself more as a corner building itself. It, it's the building that was there before your building has, you know, fewer, fewer windows and so forth. It's, it's not... It's, the building there... It's not as aggressive from my perspective. That's a classic lot line window right, right. facade, if you right. want to look at that. Uh, we have it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question is, how does, how does your building in truth seem to retreat next to the church, if you may call this it that? This is what's building? there now. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, we, it is not, our, our building is not a lot line. It's one zoning line. No, I realize. So we have the right to build windows. That, that yes, are I, under not, I so understand. It that. was a, our judgment to, to make it a finished facade rather than a, uh, a lot line facade. Um, and in many ways, we consider it to be a, a part of the building that wraps around the corner because it, we didn't feel that it would be appropriate either for the context of the church or the whole urban context of Park <laughs> Avenue to make this look like a lot line, a lot line wall with, with very small windows or very few windows. Most lot line walls have a very few number of windows no, because I, there's, a, there's a regulation about how much you can do. I do understand that. I was more thinking that because it is so, <laughs> it is, you know, aggressively a, a building that has both facades are, you know, equal or more so, that it, it doesn't necessarily seem as a neutral background to the church as you were suggesting to me. It's, it's a more aggressive background than that doesn't mean it would have to go to the point of being a real lot line building with very small windows, but perhaps if it were a little less, it, it might be a little... Right, I think I tend to agree with that. And, and I, I think about uh, your argument for appropriateness and sort of drawing from uh, the fact that this district is uh, an apartment district, that there's definitely a scale and form to this over the years. Um, and you do see buildings that are similar heights, but I think that two issues, at least for me, are raised just by the design. And one is that this is in the mid block, it's not at a corner. And because it's in the mid block, should, mid -block, should we respect that? Having said that, I think it's the tallest building in the mid block. So you usually see the setbacks coming out at the corners. In the mid block, they tend to be more flat. And if that's not the case, I think it'd be helpful for us to understand. Uh, what you see in the mid block. The second thing is about the secondary and, and mm -hmm. primary facade. And I would agree with Commissioner Chapin that I don't think you necessarily want to see a blank facade, but I think we do want to perhaps see some distinction. And that would, in my opinion, read more in the vocabulary of apartment bu buildings. I see. Well, are, we, are, we, are we going to comments around the well, we went into design. Okay. But, okay. Uh, Just one point. There are two very 
I don't want, don't want to call them absolutely similar, but reasonably similar situations like this. One is the Trinity Churchyard, where there is a finished facade on that lot where the church uh, graveyard is located. That is the Trinity, the Trinity Center, I think it's called, uh, windows that go wrap right around the building as, a, as primary facades, even though it's mid lot. And the second one is Grace Church at uh, 12th? 12th and Broadway, Broadway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where there is a, the, the, you know, a famous church um, of John, I think, um, and a finished facade mid-block that returns from Broadway heading east to form a, a backdrop. And it would seem to me, architecturally and from a mm -hmm. kind of a Centigraphic point of view with regards to the whole district, if it is so visible, mm -hmm. one would want to treat it not as a secondary or a, or a minor facade because it is so visible and it's unusual. And, and because it's unusual, it, it shouldn't try to be like something that it isn't, which is a lot line yeah. wall. It should have a it should turn, it, it should, it's a three-dimensional building. It should turn the corner, it should have a, a strong presence, it should yeah. respect the church, all of which we think yeah. we're doing, but maybe we have to, you know, maybe there's some tweaks here or some changes. But I don't think you want to have a, a real significant mid-block look between buildings. It's, a, it's truly turning the corner as though it was a street. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just going to Dan in the other two instances, uh, Trinity and, and Grace said, the building is not as close, is it, to the um, to the church? I mean, isn't there more separation? Perhaps I'm wrong. I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. One of the issues is just that the church is very, very close to the to the, your existing building, so there's not much. Right. Uh, <laughs> space for the church to be recognized uh, separately uh, from my perspective. I'm well, sorry, Adi? Yeah, Adi, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, if it's appropriate to, to comment now, I, I, I feel like we need to kind of step, yeah, we are step back from, from the discussion around the design. Um, uh, you know, per personally, I don't have any problem. I actually think that there's this very strong design. I just have a fundamental disagreement with the premise you laid out early on. And um, about, about, the, about the, the two choices that you had to make. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that this site, this, this institution, uh, w the, the relationship between the institution and Park Avenue has always been that we have a sense of this kind of compound, uh, a, more than a single edifice, more than a building, but an, an, an extended, um, the, rusticate, the rusticated stone, as, as well as the kind of the iteration, um, the, the multiple versions of itself over time as, as it grew and as it changed. And that's what makes it really um, an incredibly valuable thing here on, on Park Avenue. So I think it is the first um, sort of, we need to recognize it as the primary. That is its height its height on the street, the, the kind of the space that it makes above it and for the street, its relationship as an institution that takes up this kind of compound space in the same way that St. Ignatius and to a lesser extent Regis does. And, uh, and so that, to me, that, that was the first thing. And so then what would have followed would have been a, a building and, and I'm, in, uh, I'm in support of, of a residential structure here that sets back behind in some form and, and uh, sort of is synthetic with the, with the, with the existing uh, rectory elements. And so whether that means just the fragment face or it means the fragment plus the roof of the, of the parish of the rectory, uh, some, one way or another, that it would be the, the first, the primary, the dominant, the, the, the as you said, scenographic, the, the kind of the space of the, of the lower building and the historic building on Park Avenue and 85th, and then the, the new residential building set back from it, which is not to say that it then can't take a kind of a vertical face, and as you said, a kind of a street wall face, but set back from the church the, the height of the church and the massing that the church takes up on the corner. 
All right, yes, M Michael. Okay, um, are there other questions? All right, uh, why don't we take a testimony and then we can probably have more discussions. Uh, Will Brightbill from Council Member Dan Gorodnik's office. Hello, Will Brightbill from Council Member Dan Gorodnik's office. I want to recognize uh, the Scrivener staffer, Patrick. Uh, we wrote this letter together, uh, the two offices, and I'm going to read the letter from the Council Member and the State Senator. First, we would like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission for its role in passing the new Park Avenue Historic District. The iconic and world-renowned Park Avenue is now protected throughout much of the Upper East Side, preserving the jewel of our city for future generations. Today, we write in response to a proposal for the Park Avenue Christian Church Parish House, located at 1010 Park Avenue, scheduled to be heard by Manhattan's Community Board A tonight and by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission today on October 21st, 2014. Uh, the, church, the church is requesting certificates of appropriateness to allow the demolition of the parish house and the construction of a new 16-story building containing apartments and church facilities. The entire church complex at 1010 Park Avenue, originally the South Reformed Church, was built between 1909 and 1911. The complex was designed by architect Bertram Godhue, a partner of the firm Cram, Godhue & Ferguson, one of the preeminent American designers of the early 20th century. Godhue reportedly modeled the complex after Saint-Chapelle in Paris, and it is considered an outstanding example of ecclesiastical Gothic revival type and style. Situated on the southwest corner of Park Avenue and East 85th Street, the South Reformed Church complex originally consisted of a remarkable, tall and narrow Gothic-inspired church, the matching adjoining parsonage, now referred to as the parish house, and initially separated by a full courtyard, a brick rectory at the back of the lot. The church building remains almost exactly as, as designed by Godhue. The parish house was partially altered in a rather sensitive manner in 1962 at the street level. Neither of us, being the council member and the state senator, uh, we were able to discern any change when shown the before and after photos of the restoration. The four-story former rectory was thoroughly modified in 1962 by architects Merrill and Holmgren, uh, adding a five-story addition at the rear and a beige brick that is secondary to the main stone facade. The, additional, the addition started at 21 feet 5 inches from the original facade and filled in part of the courtyard. Because the addition is set so far back and because it's, it's simple com contextual design, it looks more like the adjacent apartment building rather than the former rectory. The north bay of the facade was altered with new windows and doors, but the coarse field stone was matched to what was existing. The proportions at Park Avenue height, profile, roof profile, and entire South Bay were retained. Having now studied this issue for a number of months, we believe that the adjoining four-story parish house was meant to be integral to the complex as a whole because it provides a scaled buffer allowing the church to be viewed on all four sides. The light and, and light to enter the sanctuary from every direction. As was noted by several LPC commissioners in the designation hearing, a critical fragment of the original parish house remains today, and we hope that you will take steps to protect it, as well as the rest of the carefully restored front facade and gable roof line, and any development plans that, de that are deemed appropriate. Despite the presence of the scaffolding, the front facade of the building remains contextual to the adjacent Park Avenue Christian Church and to 1000 Park Avenue, which incorporated design aspects of the church and parish house's facades in its original design, which remains today. Together, 1000 Park Avenue, the church, and the parish house create an important unified architectural ensemble spanning the entire block. For many of the reasons outlined above, we are concerned by the specifics by the specific 16-story building currently proposed for the site of the parish house at 1010 Park Avenue. In order to properly replace the current parish house, any building must meet a number of criteria to be appropriate. Foremost, the architecture must be of a style worthy of Park Avenue and the historic district. Additionally, an appropriate building must show reverence to the neighboring buildings already deemed contributing to the historic district. In that regard, it must be of a scale appropriate next to one of the iconic churches on Park Avenue. It is our belief that the scale of this proposed building, however, does not defer in any way to the church or to the other landmark at 1000 Park Avenue. With its soaring street wall, large windows, and limestone facade, 
The building appears to crowd out and dominate these two important historic structures, while blocking out light and obscuring views of the church from the south. On the other hand, it is important to recognize that there are several, in, several aspects of this proposal worth distinction. A development plan will allow the church much needed funds, both in the short term for immediate repairs and provide a long-term endowment to, for upkeep. We have asked for, but have been denied, the terms of the agreement between the developer and the church. As members of the community have noted, the church should guarantee to the city that it will responsibly use any endowment solely for the upkeep of the historic church building, similar to a, seven, similar to a 74 711 permit. Additionally, the proposed development provides the church valuable annex space for programming and light in its rear apse as a result of a rear yard. These aspects should be considered in any subsequent proposals. In conclusion, we believe that it is important for any future development plans for, one, for 1010 Park Avenue to incorporate the original facade in the contextual Gothic proportions or portions of the parish house while maintaining deference to the neighboring church and apartment house in both scale and style. We appreciate your attention on this matter. Best regards, Daniel R. Gerodnik, Council Member and State Senator Liz Kruger. Thank you. <clears throat> the next speaker is Letha uh, Thompson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Letha Thompson. I'm the District Manager for Manhattan Community Board 8. Park Avenue Christian Church has presented a plan to demolish the annex within their complex and construct a new building containing church facilities and apartments on the annex site and add a new accessible entrance to the church on East 85th Street. At the full board meeting on Wednesday, October 15, 2014, Community Board 8 voted to disapprove the church's application by a margin of 36 yes, 6 no, one abstention, one not voting for cause. I am submitting Community Board 8's full resolution to the commission regarding the application for Tinsley Park Avenue. In the interest of time, I will now read excerpts from this resolution. Whereas the church was designated in a Gothic revival style by Cram Goodhue Ferguson and was completed in 1911, its design was inspired by features of the Saint Chapelle in Paris, including its 70 foot spire. Whereas the annex parish house was originally completed in 1911 and served as a church rectory. In 1963, it was altered by Merrill and Holbrin into a five story church facility that pushed back from the street wall and essentially replicated the historic facade. Whereas, as part of their 1963 alteration, Merrill and Holbrin chose to incorporate part of the original 1911 elevation into the existing annex at the southern end of the facade with its distinctive two-story oriel windows, whereas the recent designation of the Park Avenue Historic District includes the church but refers to the annex as having no style, even though the front elevation is designed in the Gothic Revival style to match the adjacent church, whereas the applicant, Excel Development Company, proposes to demolish the 45-foot wide existing annex and construct a 150 foot high, 16 story building. The first three floors will be a community facility to be used by the church and the 13 <coughs> stories above will be residential. Whereas at the northern elevation along East 85th Street, the applicant proposes to cut through the original historic masonry of the church to create a wheelchair lift entrance with a wood door and a side light and a new limestone lintel whereas the annex, the church, and 1000 Park Avenue, all designed in a Gothic Revival style, present a unified street wall on Park Avenue between 84th and 85th Street. Whereas even though the Landmarks Preservation Commission found the annex to be a non-contributing or no-style building within the historic district, 1000 Park Avenue, the annex, and the church are all designed in a Gothic Revival style, and this is noted in the designation report for the district. Whereas part of the historic fabric of the original rectory in 1911 is incorporated into the annex, the southern bay with its distinctive oriel windows, thus the historic fabric provides most, almost half of the front elevation. 
whereas the proposed height of the new building at 204 feet, including mechanicals, 39 feet higher than 1000 Park Avenue to the south and 114 feet higher than the church to the north, 90 feet higher, 160 to the top of the slender spire, does not respect the height of the residential buildings along Park Avenue. Whereas although the applicant has stated that the punched in windows are meant to relate to the windows at 1000 Park Avenue, the proposed six foot wide new windows, nine feet six inches for floors two and three, eight foot six inches for floors four through 12, 12 feet six inches for floors 13, and 13 feet nine inches for floors 14 and 15 are much too large. The fenestration of the northern and western facade is especially inappropriate for secondary elevations within the historic district. At the north elevation, the busy arrangement of windows overwhelm the church. Whereas the top or crown of the proposed building is too aggressive within the historic district and does not reflect in any way the wedding cake design of a traditional Park Avenue apartment building. The setback presents are very narrow with the building appearing as if it rises straight up from the street wall. Whereas the spire, the roof line, and the south elevation of the church and the stained glass windows on the south elevation are all blocked from view by the applicant's proposal. Whereas the side alley between the church and the existing annex is being reduced from 12 feet to 6 feet, the amount of light entering the church through the south facing stained glass windows is compromised. The amount of light entering the church through the south facing stained glass windows, oh, I'm sorry, compromised by the reduced width of the side alley as well as by the bulk and height of the proposed new building. Whereas the applicant's proposal diminishes the church with the views of its spire and south facing elevations, severely compromising the bulk of the new building. Whereas the annex provides breathing room for the church and harmonizes completely with the church, the annex and the church together form a monumental complex. Um, I'll read the last two whereases. That whereas the applicant has failed to incorporate the historically and architecturally significant annex into the design, and whereas the proposed handicapped door on East 85th Street is unnecessary since there's already a handicapped accessible door to the church, the historic fabric of the church should not be compromised by a new door that cuts through the original masonry on the north facing elevation. Therefore, we have resolved this application is disapproved as presented. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Kelly Carroll. I just want to remind everyone that you'll be giving three minutes. Uh, there are a lot of you who are here to speak on this item, so I hope you'll just respect that time uh, as we move forward. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. After Park Avenue Historic District designation hearing, but prior to the commission's vote and the building's designation as a, quote, no style, unquote, HDC submitted a letter to the LPC to urge them to list the former rectory in the designation report with a full description of its architectural and historic significance. While the damage has already been done as far as the building's designation is concerned, HDC urges the LPC that this site's future begins with the preservation of the building which is already there. This project was pitched to our committee and to the public as the financial solution to Park Avenue Christian Church's much needed restoration. Should a skyscraper rise at 1010 Park Avenue, the church should be restored as promised. The applicant emphasized that approximately $2 million were needed, quote, immediately, unquote, including preservation for special features such as Tiffany stained glass windows and Guastavino tiles. To ensure the continued survival of this ecclesiastical gem and the jewels inside, HDC urges commissioners to not grant approval of this process without a preservation plan. Regarding the design, in cases of new construction, and in this case, a demolition within a historic district, HDC approaches proposals based on a paradigm that the historic existing buildings are the priority over new buildings which do not yet exist. To this end, we ask that the tower not crowd the Park Avenue Christian Church and further eliminate what little breathing room it currently has. We ask that there be at least a 12-foot separation between these two buildings, the church is undisputed designated fabric and lies to the north of the building proposed. So, light into its inner sanctum from the south is critical and integral to its function and beauty as a building. HDC also asks that the new building's height be reduced, which could be achieved by removing the penthouse. 
The penthouse is too large of a mass, and it is an ornate distraction from the quiet facade that rests below it. Overall, the committee found the design creative and the materials laudable, but assembled in a peculiar style recognized by our committee as Gotham Gothic, a cartoonist version of Art Deco skyscrapers best suited to animation, not the real world of Park Avenue. The committee welcomes the utilization of a cornice and string courses. However, we felt that these ele elements could have related better to 1000 Park Avenue in deference to architect Emery Roth's tasteful composition. We strongly suggest pr pronouncing the base, possibly in a darker material. A distinctive base is a Park Avenue formula that works and should be employed here. Speaking proactively, HDC implores the applicant to determine an ADA solution at this point in time. Access could be configured within the new building to access the church and preclude a future C of A and future obstruction of the church building. I'm sorry, your time is up. I'm Thank sorry. You. The next speaker is Barry Schneider. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Commissioners, my name is Barry Schneider, and I've lived on the east side for the last 50 years, the last 22 of which as a member of Community Board 8 and as a president of the East 60s Neighborhood Association. <clears throat> I learned this project because it did come before the Community Board, but today I speak as a private citizen. I support the proposal before you this afternoon. The Commission, excuse me, <clears throat> the Commission has weighed earlier this year, had paved the way earlier this year with the designation of the Park Avenue Historic District, which I commend. This designation completed the protection of this historic and architecturally distinctive part of this great New York Boulevard. Regarding the 1963 annex of the Park Avenue, Hist Park Avenue Christian Church, the no-style designation means there is no rationale to maintain preserving it. In this regard, some folks tend to, think, to confuse nostalgia with architectural merit. Landmarking is forever. Just because you've grown accustomed to its facade doesn't qualify the annex as a contributing building to the historic district. In fact, the annex was determined by you not to be a contributing building. Naturally, it's proposed new building. To my mind, this building is appropriate. New buildings in historic districts do not have need to replicate what is there. The new building materials, finishes, and architectural details will complement the building to its north and its south. One final point. The church needs the development in order to restore and preserve the historic sanctuary. They have made a public commitment to establish a preservation endowment. I urge you to approve this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Judy Schneider. Judith Schneider. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Judith Schneider, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the East 60s Neighborhood Association. ESNA is a 24-year-old association and covers 48 blocks, but I am speaking today as a private citizen. I am here to speak in support of the new building for the Park Avenue Christian Church. I think the building is appropriate and will be built with quality materials that will complement the stone of the historic church. At the time of the Park Avenue designation, I believe the LPC would have included the annex if it believed it should be preserved. I do not think this application should be denied just because a modern building will replace the annex. The, new propo the proposed new building is a street wall building, which is a defining element within the historic district. It has a setback, as do many Park Avenue buildings. 1020 Park, a contributing building across 85th Street to the north, is taller with setbacks. One of the most important aspects of this project is to create an ADA entrance to the church on the north side. Community Board 8's resolution states that the entrance for handicapped already exists, but this is truly not the case. The door at the northwest side of the church that allows for handicapped access would require worshipers arriving after the start of the service to enter behind the altar to get to their seats. 
Having spent some time in a wheelchair this year, I know that I would feel like a second-class citizen if I were required to pass from behind the altar and parade before the entire congregation to take my seat. As you can see, this has become an important issue to me personally. Also, it was mentioned that the proposed new building replacing the annex would have ADA access, but that door is the door to the new community space. Even though that space connects to the sanctuary, the door is not a door to the sanctuary. There must be a door that allows for all parishioners to enter directly into the magnificent edifice. This entry through liturgical doors is part of the religious experience. These ADA comments would also hold true for the Jewish congregation that meets weekly in the church. I urge you to approve this application and thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you. Rick Bell? Good afternoon, my name is Rick Bell. I'm executive director of the American Institute of Architects New York chapter. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to abbreviate the written testimony and try to save some time and say that we're in support of three key issues of moment today. New buildings in historic districts, housing creation, and building height street wall. As um, an exhibition we did called Context Contrast demonstrated, it's possible to include new structures in architecturally distinct and sensitive historic districts if there's a skillful use of appropriate materials and an understanding of scale and proportion. The AIA New York chapter supported the creation of the Park Avenue Historic District and previously commended this project in regard to materials, massing, and fenestration. AIA New York supports the insertion of a taller structure into the street fabric of Park Avenue because of the overarching importance of the street wall as distinct from the visibility of any given building, landmark or not, as a three-dimensional object. The beauty of Park Avenue as the city's preeminent Grand Boulevard comes from the integrity and consistency of building height which in conjunction with the street width, plantings, and art define a visual experience that goes beyond any one building or corner. Notable interruptions of that continuous wall plane, including the Seagram <coughs> Building, Lever House St. Mark's, and the Park Avenue Christian Church receive special attention and protection. But background buildings are more difficult to validate in this regard. The rectory building is not a contributing building, and in our opinion, in the absence of original significant fabric, the building massing in and of itself is not adequate to be uh, deemed uh, uh, a contributing structure and, and worth preserving. Um, we noted before, I'll reiterate, that there is a crying need for housing in New York City as our population expands and housing vacancy re rates remain distressingly low. Both uh, luxury housing, market rate housing, and affordable housing are critical for the future of all five boroughs of New York City. And given the demand for housing, we conceptually support the idea of inserting a residential structure uh, wherever possible, wherever it makes sense. And in this instance, where the Park Avenue Christian Church Annex is located adjacent to the sanctuary. A new building can find a place in a vibrant urban context of a growing and ever-changing city. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity of sharing these thoughts here today. Thank you. Anne Isabel Friedman. Good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners, and staff. I'm Ann Isabel Friedman, speaking on behalf of the Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy's Public Policy Committee has reviewed the proposal to demolish the annex to the Park Avenue Christian Church and construct a new building. The committee recognized that the annex building has been substantially altered and is willing to consider the demolition and replacement of the annex with an appropriate new building. We thank the architects for a thorough presentation and for responding to comments and questions from the Conservancy's committee. However, the committee did not find that this building is appropriate to the Park Avenue Historic District. The district is composed predominantly of apartment buildings of about 15 stories, many in classical revival styles. These masonry clad buildings emphasize symmetry and proportion and feature elegant decorative details. While a few mostly post-war buildings have setbacks for terraces and penthouse, a boxier max massing is more typical. This proposal pulls elements from several different precedents and loses the unified form that is essential to the district. The base and shaft are from pre-war tripartite compositions while the upper floors have a partial post-war setback. The windows at the top are larger than the lower floors 
inverting the typical columnar design. The abstracted buttresses detailing the roof appear more Art Deco than Gothic Revival. The developers have pre presented this as a mid-block background building, but rising above the church, it will be highly visible and more prominent than many corner buildings with a greater impact than anything that's gone up on this part of Park Avenue in recent years. The entire upper section should be rethought for a more balanced and graceful tower. Lowering the roof line to match the neighbor at 1000 Park would provide a more cohesive appearance for the block. We would suggest reducing the massing by setting back the penthouse levels on the side facade. The bulky mechanicals create an ungainly roof line. Um, we've heard that they're needed uh, because of the church and the residential building using them, but perhaps the enclosure could be perforated to lighten its appearance. Any decorative details on the front facade, upper levels should continue around the side. When our committee saw the presentation, the buttress elements were in bright white terracotta, which created a harsh contrast with the limestone and a top heavy effect. We understand that other finishes are under consideration. We appreciate the commitment that the pastor and the congregation have to their landmark building. We understand that the church would benefit from proceeds connected to this new building and plans to use funds for much needed restoration and to establish a preservation endowment. We hope there's a way to develop a new building that maintains the standards of the Park Avenue Historic District and offers support to the significant landmark church. Thank you. Thank you. Tara Kelly. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Honorable Commissioners. I'm Tara Kelly with Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Uh, 1010 Park Avenue, sorry. Uh, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts was proud to be a part of a coalition of organizations who came together to advocate for the designation of the Park Avenue Historic District. Unfortunately, the Park Avenue Christian Church was left vulnerable by declaring the parish house as having no style in the designation report. Friends has respectfully requested that the commission reevaluate the designation and amend it with the appropriate style of Gothic revival. The Park Avenue Christian Church and Parish House together form a monumental complex. The relationship between the buildings is an important part, part of the history of the site, and although part of the parish house was rebuilt in the 1960s, the arrangement and detailing continue to be important. A designation of no style not only ignores the remaining 1910 southern rectory facade with its two-story oriel window, but denies that the 1960s changes were completed in the Gothic Revival style as described in the designation report itself. The Park Avenue Christian Church and Parish House are both detailed with coarse granite fieldstone and limestone trim, forming a unified campus that would be seriously diminished through the dramatic alteration of the one or the other. It is the position at Friends that both the Park Avenue Christian Church and Parish House should be designated in the Gothic Revival style and that both buildings are important to the Park Avenue Historic District. As for the proposal at hand, the project team has neglected to incorporate this historic and architecturally significant parish house into their design. When the parish house was altered in 1963, Marilyn Homgren made a concerted effort to push back the addition and essentially replicate the historic facade. We urge this current team to follow suit and work with the existing historic conditions rather than demolish any original fabric. The proposed new building at 1010 Park Avenue is not appropriate, nor is it sensitive to the surrounding context of the Park Avenue Historic District, and nor is it respectful of or deferential to the Park Avenue Christian Church. First, the 16-story design is too angular and vertical in style, with an aggressively conspicuous crown evoking an Art Deco office tower rather than the revivalist-style residential buildings that are its neighbors. Within the district, there is only one building at 99, sorry, 944 Park Avenue listed as Art Deco in style. Among the 64 buildings in the district, 48 are revivalist in style, mostly Renaissance revival, but also colonial, medieval, and Gothic revival, among many others. The contemporary character of the building with large windows, limestone panels, and a curtain wall stands in stark contrast to its neighbors. Although the applicants have stated that the fenestration is, is meant to relate to its neighbor, a 1915 Gothic Revival Emory Roth building with punched openings, the proposed windows are much too large, disrupting the rhythm of the streetscape. Furthermore, the amount of glazing on the northern and western facades is grossly inappropriate for a secondary elevation. In sum, this new proposal is better suited for commercial midtown than residential Park Avenue. Friends urges the commission to deny the application. Thank you. Thank you. Nicola Weir. Weir. <coughs> Good 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioner. I'm speaking <coughs> on behalf of Kathy Jolowitz, who was unable to be here today. As the York, uh, sorry, my name is Nicola Weir, and I attended Park Avenue Christian Preschool that was there until a year ago. As the Yorkville historian, I am dedicated to keeping the lost memories of our community alive. I am also a founding member and president of the 41-year-old East 83rd, 84th Street Block Association, whose boundaries include 16 blocks from 2nd to 5th Avenues with 4,500 residents. At Exdell's Park Avenue Christian Church Annex site presentation to the Landmarks Committee October 6th, I was startled to see this shocking pillar of a building looming out of the contextual continuity of Park Avenue in defiance of the aesthetic and uniform elegance of the boulevard. It just doesn't fit there. The plans award a slim alley between the church and the building only because the side buttresses require it, yet obliterating the beauty of the church on its south side, depriving the church windows of adequate light, and cutting a mysterious second door into the stonework on the north side. Churches are part of our history, and they should not be dwarfed by modern times. This country was founded on freedom of religion, and their monuments deserve to be respected. Our history is our future. Don't let it be dismantled piece by piece till there is no choice of what is left to respect. Thus, I would strongly recommend that a more sensitive approach to be taken in respect to this particular church annex, sitting in the midst of this newly preserved gem of an avenue, and not destroying the uniformity of its design. Keep the original facade, with the slate roof of the annex as the entrance to the new building and develop a shape and height more in harmony with the surrounding ambiance of the avenue. Setting the building back would give more light and air coupled with a more proportionate height to allow a revelation of the church steeple. Harmony with the, within the old and new together with skilled imagination is what is needed here and it could be done. Thank you, Pat Chalwood. Thank you, Elizabeth Ashby. <coughs> And the speaker after that is Edward uh, Kennedy and then Felipe Ventigit. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Elizabeth Ashby speaking for the Defenders of the Historic Upper East Side. The proposal to build a residential tower on the site of the Park Avenue Christian Church Parish House is contrary to every principle of landmark preservation. It would demolish a significant Gothic revival building, destroy an important church complex, obscure the south facade of an historic church, and break the continuity of a rare single style city block. As the designation report notes, the entire Park Avenue block between 84th and 85th Streets is in the Gothic revival style. The church on the north and 1000 Park Avenue on the south flank the smaller and more modest parish house creating an unusually pleasing ensemble. The report rightly notes that Emery Roth probably chose the Gothic revival style for 1000 Park Avenue to complement the recently completed Park Avenue Christian Church, which it adjoins. Like churches everywhere, the Park Avenue Christian Church is meant to be seen from all sides. As an appendage to the proposed tower, its three-dimensionality is lost along with its imposing presence and from the south, it disappears from view. The report correctly describes the parish house as being in the Gothic revival style and notes that the original southern portion remains. Listing as style none is totally contradictory. This astonishing and obvious error should have been corrected by now and the parish house must be considered and protected as the Gothic revival building that it is. Furthermore, in 2013, the Landmarks Preservation Commission recognized the importance of the parish house and of the entire church complex when it entered into a standstill agreement with the property owners. It is normal for Christian churches to be surrounded by their supporting buildings, such as rectories and parish houses. These buildings complement their churches and are subordinate to the sanctuaries themselves. This is the case with the Park Avenue Christian Church Complex, and it must remain the case. The church must continue to be the dominant building on the site, and the parish house must continue to enhance and defer to it. The proposed tower would be gravely damaging to the site, to the block, and to Park Avenue, and to its historic district, and we ask that the, that the application be denied. Thank you. Edward Kennedy?
Hello, my name is Edward Carmody and I'm with Civitas. Civitas is a nonprofit community-based planning organization that since 1981 has worked to improve zoning, land use policies, and quality of life on the Upper East Side and in East Harlem. Civitas supported the nomination of Park Avenue between 79th and 96th Street to be designated a New York City Historic District with the inclusion of the Park Avenue Christian Church and Parish House located at 1010 Park Avenue. Civitas respects the consideration and decision of the Landmarks Preservation Commission to deem the Park Avenue Christian Parish House a no-style building. We understand that this determination allows the structure to be demolished. We recognize that many historic churches are in dire need of funding for repairs and to continue their mission. To the extent that a new structure will be constructed on the site of 1010 Park Avenue, the new development should give back to the Park Avenue Christian Church in community space and funds for church maintenance and restoration. On September 22nd, representatives from Park Avenue Christian, Byer, Blinder, Bell, and Kramer Levin presented the proposed development plans to members of the Civitas Zoning Committee. Civitas also spoke with a member of the Park Avenue Christian Ministry Council, a nine-member governing council voted in by parishioners. We appreciate that parishioners have been included throughout the process at congressional meetings and we understand that the majority of parishioners in attendance voted in favor of the development. Civitas believes that any building proposed for this location should complement the church and create an appropriate dialogue with the prevailing architectural vocabulary of the broader historic district. Civitas is concerned that the proposed design may not fully achieve these goals. Overall, it is crucial that the proposed development embrace the character so beloved of the Park Avenue Historic District. Civitas urges the Landmarks Preservation Commission to consider the design extremely carefully in the context of the landmarked Park Avenue Christian Church and the Park Avenue Historic District. We appreciate the opportunity to comment on this proposal, and we hope that this information is useful to the Landmarks Preservation Commission and development team. Thank you. Thank you. Philippe uh, Van Tegate. Oh, he left? Okay. Marjorie Watrobski. And then after that, Connie Packard and Louis Alfredo Cartagena. Good afternoon. My name is Marjorie Wotrowski. I am a resident of Queens, and for the past two years, my husband Casey and I have been members of the Park Avenue Christian Church. I also serve as the Pastoral Associate for Children's and Youth Ministries at the Park, while I am pursuing my Master in Divinity degree and ordination at New York Theological Seminary. Arriving to the city from upstate, we looked all over the city for a congregation that we could call our spiritual home, and we knew immediately when we walked in the doors at the park that we were home. Park Avenue Christian Church is a very special and unique place. The congregation over the years, with its long history of social activism, and services has literally given itself away in service to others. Now that we have this opportunity to pursue this development project that enables us to preserve the sanctuary and continue to be a vital presence in the city, I urge you please to approve our application. Thank you. Thank you. Connie Packard? Connie's not here? Okay, uh, Louis Alfredo Cartagena. Okay. Good day, my name is Luis Alfredo Cartagena Sayas. I'm a member of Park Avenue Christian Church for the past six years. I've been 32 years teaching for the City University of New York and I am a native New Yorker, residing in Corona, Queens, brother. Um, I am also the Associate Pastor for Outreach for Park Avenue uh, Christian Church where I serve uh, in the, as a coordinator of the community lunch program, which we service like over 250 people each week, uh, giving them hot meals and fraternity. Um, it is a, a vital, you know, that uh, we have our space, and I hope that you will, and I concur with uh, the people who have come before me from my community, that you accept our application so that we can start administering our our, 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 our community as soon as possible. Thank you. Richard's term, the next speaker. Uh, 
I'm Richard Sturm, a retired seminary professor and resident of Brooklyn and a 44-year member of Park Avenue Christian Church. I became active in the congregation when I came to New York to enter Union Theological Seminary about six years after the parish house ceased to exist and our annex building was constructed. Over the past decades, I've served in, on the staff as one of its members, taught Bible study, served on various governing boards and committees, helped in mission outreach, and visited the sick and dying. My love for the church, great as it was in the 1970s, has grown immensely since the ministry of our present pastor, Alvin Jackson. With his leadership, we've become much better at practicing what we have always preached, a gospel of inclusion and diversity, and a beloved community that seeks to witness and work for justice, mercy, and the common good in our city, nation, and world. We have a great love for our beautiful sanctuary designed by Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson, but we have struggled for decades to maintain it and support our mission and work in this city. This development project, with this new building being proposed, gives us hope of achieving some long-term security by providing the funds needed to repair and restore it and maintain it for years to come. Moreover, the restrained and elegant design of the new building would serve as a great backdrop to the sanctuary, replace the really unattractive annex building, and actually enhance the beauty of the Park Avenue Historic District. So members of the Landmarks Commission, I urge your support of our application. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Rabbi Ari Fritkis, and after that will be Alvin Munasar and Melissa Little. Good afternoon. So I'm the rabbi of Congregation Dat Elohim, the Temple of Universal Judaism, which has shared space and a home and a heart with the Park Avenue Christian Church for 40 years now. And I'm here to voice my spiritual, I guess I would even say ethical support for the congregation and our synagogue's work together. Our church and synagogue share space, but also coordinate our efforts. Our staff and lay leaders meet regularly to work together. We both maintain open doors, and members and non-members can find a spiritual home with us. We are a kaleidoscope of New York, where people of all colors, truly, can gather with love and decorum and rejoicing. And our two congregations, along with uh, pastor you just heard, our outreach pastor, feed hungry New Yorkers every Saturday at our community lunch. One important benefit of this plan for a building next door to the church is to provide a permanent long-term solution to the church's stability and preservation of its truly magnificent sanctuary. Our church and synagogue share the financial requirements of preserving our sanctuary. What would happen to our neighborhood if we cannot do that? A dirty, crumbling church, as we see elsewhere, is hardly what will help make the Park Avenue Historic District beautiful. So we can only do that, preserve the church with our financial security. And we can only do that with the support of our neighbors, both rich and poor, with the support of the new Park Avenue Historical District, and with your support on the Landmarks Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Alvin Munasar. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Alvin Munasar. I'm the Managing Director of AMA Consulting with an expert with expertise in financial, strategic, and organizational management. For the last year and a half, I've been advising Park Avenue Christian Church on financial matters. The church is not wealthy. The church is a middle-class congregation that is relatively small and limited in the extent to which it can go by capacity of the sanctuary. This has made it difficult for it to raise money from the congregation. However, working within the constraints of the space and demographics, contributions by congregants have grown from about $90,000 a year to about $300,000 in the last seven years. These contributions are not enough to pay the bills. 
The church has been running a deficit for some time. The bottom line is the church is running out of money. Without the ability to provide new facilities on a rectory site suited for church current program and to enhance its endowment, the church will not be able to carry out its religious activities for much longer. And it will certainly be unable to afford proper maintenance of the sanctuary. Our consultants, architects, and otherwise have estimated the cost for the immediate restoration and repair for the sanctuary to exceed $2 million. That's the immediate uh, restoration. Simply put, the, ch the church cannot afford to undertake this work without proceeds it will receive from the proposed development. These proposed proceeds will allow the church to establish a robust endowment. We've been working with UBS financial advisors to develop an investment and spending strategy for this endowment so that it will ensure both the church's survival and its ability to maintain the sanctuary for future generations. The proposed demolition and redevelopment of the outmoded 1963 annex building will provide a much needed stability to the church, fund the immediate necessary capital repairs to the sanctuary, and provide added community space for the church-run programs, such as association meetings, immigration clinics, and as such. In addition, the new proposed building will enhance the historic district. Its elegant design, use of granite and limestone will fit and continue the tradition of grand apartment houses that line Park Avenue and relate well to the sanctuary. Thank you for your opportunity to share this perspective with you. We hope the commission will approve this appropriate and necessary project. Thank you. Melissa Little. I am Melissa Little. Um, I'm here representing Park Avenue Christian Church. I work at the church. I'm manager of operations. And I'd like to just reinforce the reality of our exquisite but aged sanctuary. Current maintenance needs include both the interior and the exterior. With the designation of the historic district, the sanctuary as a contributing building, which we supported wholeheartedly, repairs to the exterior must be approved by LPC staff or the commission. So proposed repairs could go anywhere from, there's a difference between if you propose a repair for genuine slate versus synthetic slate. Because of this, the same thing happens with the interior. All the work is expensive, and we're to have it done with the finest materials by experienced specialists, which is exactly why we have not been able to make most of the repairs to date. With your support of the Certificate of Appropriateness, the development will commence, providing the money that the church needs for the repairs, Likewise, the ability to establish the preservation endowment, which will allow us to preserve our sanctuary befitting the landmark that it is. I also have several letters that I'm going to submit from various people that I will just read into the record. There is a letter of support from Congressman Floyd L. H. Flake. There is a letter of support from um, Reverend Calvin Butts of the Abyssinian Baptist Church. There's a letter of support from Amadeus Durr, who's the pastor at St. Peter's Church. And there's a letter of support from Stephen Bauman, who is the minister at Christ Church. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Harrod Hardiman, John Hardiman, and then Robert Bates. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Donna Hardiman. I'm a lifelong resident of the Upper East Side, and I thank you for providing us with an opportunity to comment on this application to demolish and replace the parish house portion of the Park Avenue Christian Church complex. The applicant is asking you to split the baby, to treat the unified complex as if part of it was historically significant and part of it is not, but that's simply not the experience or the reaction you have when you view the whole. As a community, the community board, the elected officials, and preservation experts recognize the exterior features, the scale, setback of the parish house are integral to the architectural integrity of the entire Park Avenue Christian Church complex. The church was intentionally placed not in the center of the lot, but on the corner of 85th Street, and joined to a complementary parish house that by its low height serves as a buffer between the sanctuary and the apartment house next door. The placement of the parish house ensures that the notable features of the main church building, including the facade, 
flesh, slate roof, buttresses, and Gothic window arches remain clearly visible from public areas south and east of the church. A pedestrian on Park Avenue experiences the facades of the parish house and church as part of a unified street wall employing neo-Gothic style. The 1911 South Pavilion of the Parish House provides an effective balance to the church facade with its gable echoing the taller gable of the church. Whatever your opinion of the 1962 alteration, it preserved these key features of the Parish House site. Extel's proposed demolition and new high-rise will obliterate them all. In sum, I urge you to reject the application. Thank you. Thank you. John Hardiman. Thank you very much for your, for your time. Uh, I'm also here to speak against the application. And I, I'd like to address just for a few seconds the many comments that have been made uh, by the church supporters regar regarding the good works performed by the church and the need for funds to continue them. Uh, those are important issues, uh, of course. But they are not the province of today's hearing. It sounds like the church believes it has a very meritorious application in a hardship hearing. Um, in that case, they should make it. I'm sure if they do, this commission will give them a full and fair hearing. I'm also sure that this commission will require them to put forth evidence and facts in support of that hearing rather than the general comments we've heard today from some of the supporters. Germane and fair questions, such as what actually are the assets of this church? Not only cash, but other assets. Um, why wasn't the income and revenue from the school that's been there for many, many years sufficient? And that income, I believe, was substantial in the millions of dollars. What alternatives have been considered? How about a smaller building? What is the congregation? What is its size? Is it a sufficient following to support the church? These are fair questions, uh, and they would be asked. There's something cynical about the church coming here and presenting these points in effort to have you grant the application today and therefore bypass what is already set up in the rules as an appropriate form to make those arguments. It's an effort to get the benefit of the arguments without the proof. Now, I want to remind the commission this isn't the first time that both the church and the developer have been cynical in this process. You may remember that they originally filed an application for a building permit in the middle of August last year, a time calculated to get the least notice possible on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a time a couple of weeks uh, before the Jewish holidays last year when it would be difficult to marshal opposition. This commission stopped that because there had been a long-standing application uh, to make that, this area an historic district. Uh, you'll also remember, because it's very public, that as part of the process of trying to keep this secret to the last minute, parents of the school were not told until the last minute that their kids would be moved to the West Side after they had spent the summer cleaning up the school, being told it was an asbestos problem when it was really something different. And at a time when it was going to be difficult for them to get their deposits back. As it turned out, the other schools in the neighborhood enlarged their uh, um, uh, emissions so to, to let many of them in. Um, these tactics would have worked had this commission not stopped it. And we would ask the commission to stop it again by requiring the church, if, if it's going to make these hardship arguments, to do it in a hardship hearing. That picture right there, if you gave it from another angle, uh, uh, would not be as favorable to the church because you couldn't see most of it. I'm thank sorry. You. Yes, thank you. Robert Bates. Uh, my name is Robert Bates. Um, I'm principal at Walter B. Melvin Architects here in Manhattan. We specialize in restoration of historic buildings. Uh, one of them was, years ago, the Park Avenue Christian Church. Um, I was also told to say that I'm uh, not being compensated for this, and I don't even live in New York. Um, clearly, there are many areas of concern, but I want to point out a, a few of them. On the topic of stained glass windows, I understand that the proposed development has been designed to maintain some distance between it and the south elevation of the church in an attempt, I suppose, to permit ambient light to reach the large stained glass windows on that wall. The height and proximity of the proposed construction, however, will clearly cast the windows into darkness, rendering the church 
interior, gloomy at best. It was specifically the lack of gloom that prompted an early architectural critic to conclude that, quote, though it is distinctly a churchly edifice, there is none of the gloom suggested by cloistered aisles, but everywhere floods of light and sunshine. When someday those windows are filled with storied glass, the effect will be quite unrivaled by anything in America. Uh, that was from Architecture, Volume 24, September 15, 1911. It is likely that the developer will propose to illuminate the windows artificially, a method attempted at many churches with little or no success. Grace Church in New York and Central Presbyterian Church come to mind. They were both outfitted with electric lighting decades ago to illuminate important stained glass that had been sheltered by adjacent construction. But as years went by, bulbs burned out and systems fell out of maintenance and were forgotten. If adequate sunlight, or at least an abundant sky plane, is not permitted access to the south windows, the once unrivaled stained glass will fall dark and become simply unremarkable. And that would be a terrible shame. On the topic of the new north door, I understand that the proposed demolition of the parish house will render the church non-compliant as it relates to Americans with Disabilities Act. And the solution includes the installation of a new door at the north elevation. I reviewed the design, and was, uh, which was pre presented as being subtle and non-intrusive. To the contrary, the proposed design and location, while seemingly arbitrary, very much disrupt the rhythm and pace of the East 85th Street elevation to say nothing of the disruption to the interior. Uh, on the topic of architectural style, I understand that a vote earlier this year concluded that the parish house had no architectural style. There should be no argument among reasonable people that this conclusion is patently untrue. The parish house was designed in precisely the same style as the church, albeit in appropriately scaled, scaled down I'm sorry, your, your time is up. Thank you. Mary Duryak. Aaron Rowland, and then Clark Monell. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Mary Derricks, and I'm the Preservation Consultant for Historic Park Avenue. The Park Avenue Christian Church Complex is an outstanding example of early 20th century ecclesiastical architecture, and there were calls to save or designate it as an individual landmark before there was even a landmarks law. On Park Avenue, the church and the parish house, uh, which was originally the rectory building, later a school, and is also called the annex, um, they were created together to form one complete design. Even though the parish house was altered in the 1960s, it retains its relationship to the church building, including its location, its profile, the mansard roof, the original gabled South Bay, and the use of closely matching stone for the facade. Um, Historic Park Avenue believes that the parish house and the mansard roof behind it should be retained because it's an integral part of the design of the church and would allow more of the church to be seen from all sides. The church was meant to be seen as a sculptural whole rather than the more typical front-facing row house or apartment building, and the front and side facades work together to produce the full effect of the design. The proposal refers to maintaining the street wall along Park Avenue, and this is a significant ele element of the district. However, this street wall was, has historically been broken by mansions and by institutional buildings, uh, just like uh, St. Ignatius Loyola down the block. Retaining the parish house would be within that historical and architectural context of, of residential Park Avenue. Uh, the proposal also calls for a new accessible entrance on the fully designed 85th Street side facade. Um, this diminishes the, the side entrance and the rhythm of the facade. Um, there is an accessible entrance and it would be good if, if another one was somewhere else, say for example in the new building. Thank you very much. And thank you. Aaron Rowland? This is a great church complex designed by a great architect. It is inconceivable that the church's parish house facade and roof are about to be demolished to build yet another extelled tower. 
Its great architect designed both the church and its parish house as a single flowing Gothic revival building, both parts built to the same materials. They are in perfect balance and dependent on each other for this balance. Any modifications made to the parish house do not in any way change this relationship. The low-rise parish house preserves the church's southern exposure to views and light. The church, its parish house facade, and 1000 Park to the south, all Gothic revival and recognized as such by the LPC, relate and flow into each other, and with the distinguished buildings across the street, contribute to a sense of place in this new historic district. But if it is to be torn down, then I ask you to deny Extel's application. Their design does not honor this magnificent church. Building on this site must reach a higher standard than is met in its application. The plan to destroy the low-rise parish house sacrifices the existing hierarchy of height, a critical part of Goodhue's design. It is too tall and massive for the site and overpowers the important church and even 1000 Park. Plastered against the church and without setback from the street, the tower prevents onlookers from seeing the church in the round. Viewing the church from four sides is far more important than extending the street wall by one more building. The tower would block street level views of the church's south wall, stained glass windows, roof, and flesh. It would also block the all-important southern sunlight from these elements. The proposed design has a ratio of glass to masonry that is much too high, almost floor-to-ceiling windows, ill-suited for Park Avenue. It's top-heavy and breaks the traditional Park Avenue cornice line, too bulky for Park Avenue and too domineering over the church and its flesh. The tower's great expanse of smooth light limestone, white terracotta, and huge glass windows would overwhelm the dark, rough-hewn stone of the church and the rusticated brick of 1000 Park. In fact, all aspects of this design make it a building more suited to Midtown than the Park Avenue historic district. With only a narrow gap remaining between the huge tower and the church, all sunlight will be blocked from the church's stained glass window from the south. And Extel's proposed skylight and light well are frankly a joke. Too narrow and set too far down in the building to even let in ambient light. And despite their claim, it will be most difficult for sunlight to empty, enter the apse windows because of the height and position of the surrounding buildings. I'd like you to really examine the heights of the buildings around that apse. I've looked at it a lot. Sunlight is not going to go in there except maybe at the most limited time of the year. Um, and then disturbingly, this application includes a request to cut into the church's massive, rhythmically beautiful north wall for a handicapped accessible door. I'm sorry, your time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Clark Vanell. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Clark Vanell. Thank you, members of the commission, for the opportunity to speak today. Please deny a certificate of appropriateness for the proposed building at 1010 Park Avenue. Please continue to do so until the developer submits a request that respects the parish house's contributions to a critical element of the new Park Avenue Historic District, the Park Avenue Christian Church. Such a proposal would have scale and proportions consistent with the existing structure and would maintain its first 20 feet of depth, not just the fragment, but the whole facade, 20 feet back, which includes the, the gabled roof. Which, by the way, is what Council Member Gorodnik and State Senator Kruger, Kruger have asked for in their recently read letter today. This is also what the community wants and what noted architects, historians, and pres preservationists want. In fact, it seems the only people who don't want this are those that stand to make a lot of money by building the biggest building they can get away with. Earlier this year, your predecessor commission made an excellent decision to create the new Park Avenue Historic District. Unfortunately, the report's treatment of the parish house was confusing referring to both Gothic, Revival, and No Style. Additionally, some of you expressed uneasiness or outright disagreement with the language of that report. Just by way of comparison, the National Register of Historic Places notes that the entire Park Avenue Christian Church complex, including the parish house, is contributing to the historic district. More simply and perhaps more importantly, the Park Avenue Christian Church complex looks essentially the same today as it did upon Cram and Goodhue's completion in 1911. That is, if you could see it, behind the obfuscating scaffolding that stood for the last year and a half. 
The new proposal is a radical departure from this idea and hence not appropriate. Please do not compromise the new Park Avenue Historic District. After all, what would it say about the new district if the very first act within it were the demise of one of its most critical elements, the Park Avenue Christian Church complex? Thank you. Thank you. Drake, Drake Tempest, Ezra Monell, and then Victor Garassi. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Drake Tempest. I'm passing out a set of images that will illustrate my points today, of which there are principally two. First, the tower is unacceptable in its current form, and second, the proposed wheelchair entrance defiles the north wall of the church. If you look at the set that I passed out, page one of the images, which is also reflected on the screen, shows that the tower is simply too tall. It dominates the Thousand Park to its south, and it completely overwhelms the church, church on its north. You saw from earlier slides in the presentation that it's in fact the tallest building on this area of Park Avenue. Page two of my set shows the, me the measurements. At the top of the page, you see that the tower is 207 feet tall. At its left, the cornice line of 1,000 parks is 158 feet. That's a true comparison because nothing above the cornice line of 1,000 parks is visible from the street, whereas the entire tower is visible from the street. And you can also see on that page the height of the flesh in the church. Not only, is the church, not only is the tower too tall, it is also placed in an unacceptable position. Please turn to page three, which shows the existing condition in which the annex behind the parish house is set back 21 and a half feet from the street and 12 and a half feet from the church, revealing the flesh, the roof, the walls, and the windows of the church. Page four shows that the tower blocks the views of these elements, leaving visible only a small part of the church. In fact, the set away from the church is about seven feet on an apples to apples basis, far less than the 12 and a half feet that currently exists. The next reason that the tower is unacceptable is that the windows are simply too big. Page five shows that the windows are six feet wide and up to 14 feet tall. Also, the top of the tower is too bulky and bright. Page six shows a ribbed cornice line on the east and north elevations that frankly looks like a tiara. A white limestone screen caps the building the cornice and screen are entirely incompatible with neighboring buildings. In short, the tower looks like a midtown office building. Turn to page seven. The tower looks like 30 rock, only with more and bigger windows and less masonry. Turn to page eight for a view of the north elevation of this office-like building, which has already been drawn to your attention. The busy patchwork of huge windows overpowers the church and the flesh. Please do not approve any plan unless it preserves the facade of the parish house and its roof rises only to a height appropriate for a site between a thousand park and the church, sets the tower back from the street and apart from the church as the annex now does, and presents a fenestration and facade that are appropriate for a residential building at Upper Park Avenue. Turn now to the wheelchair entrance on the north wall of the church. Page nine shows you the, propo the proposed door and lift towards the Park Avenue end of the wall. The door violates the careful rhythm of the towering stained glass windows and buttresses on this imposing wall, and the architect should, propose a, should submit a proposal that does not breach it. There are at least two alternatives. One is existing doors on the west end of the north wall, which you also see on page 9. The other on page 10 is dedicated access to the new tower that is to be reserved for church space. Thank you very much. Ezra, Ezra Minette? And then Victor Grassi. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you. My name is Esther Manel. Three minutes, two points. First one is an issue with the applicant's claim that Merrill and Holmgren's 1963 alteration takes away from the historical integrity of the parish house. This is not consistent with historical facts. 52 years ago, the New York Times followed the church's development and described the new buildings, how the new building complemented the church. I quote the Times from 1962, the new building of Gothic architecture in keeping with the church. 1963, the facade for the new facility will be built to harmonize with the church, which was designed by Ralph Adams Cram. Yet again in 63, the facade of the new building is to resemble that of the church. 
Merrill and Holmgren's respectful renovation did not take anything away from the church and still allows today for the whole church compound to be an anchoring Gothic revival structure in the new Park Avenue district. Their alteration permitted the church and its steeple to be appreciated by all, just as Ralph Adams Cram intended in 1909. Please look at the photos. If Merrill and Homerem could keep that same sense of architectural style and sense of place, then why can't the current developer? The second point is what would Ralph Adams Cram think of this proposal? He passed in 1942, so I went to the next best source, Ethan Anthony. AIA principal architect, president of the successor firm of Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson, today called Cram and Ferguson Architects. They are the architect of record for Old South Dutch, the original name of Park Avenue Christian. Ethan Anthony is also the author of this authoritative book on Ralph Adams Cram. I sent him the current proposal and received his letter today, which I submitted this morning and I will now share. Ralph Adams Cram tells us that it is most important for the urban church to retain a proper proportion in relation to the buildings adjacent to it. The most recent design for the new residential tower not only removes the important parish house element, but replaces it with a new modern glass and steel tower in the current popular nihilist German industrial style. He goes on to say, Sadly, after the change, Old South Dutch will feel the more threatened, another loss in the war of ideas between related fabric and of the attitude that those in the towers owe nothing to the street. There is no valid argument for removing the parish house other than the expediency of wealth. He closes his letter by noting the current proposal's openly hostile stance. There we have it, commissioners. Help save the integrity of the designated historic district and honor the legacy of one of America's most foremost architects. Please disapprove the current proposal. Thank you. Vic Victor Garassi. And after that, Jane Cranston, Renata Sari, and Michelle Birnbaum. I'm Victor Gerasi, a resident of 1035 Park Avenue. Here to present a letter from the Board of Directors of 1035 Park Avenue uh, with the full support of the residents of 1035 Park Avenue, Mr. Klatskin, who is a registered architect, a member of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects, and the Regent of the American Architectural Foundation. Uh, the letter is, Dear Madam Chair, I'm writing to express my professional and personal disbelief that the Landmarks Commission is considering approving the demolition of the Park Avenue Christian Church Parish House and the construction of an out-of-scale replacement that will smother the church and its beautiful details. Almost every preservation organization in the world has moved to the concept of stabilization as opposed to rolling back time. The fact that landmarks might allow the demolition of the parish house is not in keeping with the best practices in the field today. The parish house is just as much a part of the church as the church is. To decide to take down the parish house is known as style picking, and that arbitrary determination of taste has no place in the science of preservation. The, the, the placement building that is proposed is troubling. While respecting some horizontal components of the neighbor, the building is out of scale in its height and fenestration. There are few things more beautiful in the world than the steep roofs, intricate spires, and light-filled elements of Gothic, neo-Gothic ecclesiastical buildings. This one, designed by Goodyear et al., is a particularly magnificent example. To allow a building with all the ungraceful components of a building that one would normally find on the Avenue of the Americas to be cramped next to this beautiful example of American architecture is to turn your back on the importance of the art of architecture. I implore you to reject the proposal in front of you and to ask the extremely qualified architects charged with this project to return with a building that respects the church in scale, material, fenestration, and form. Jane Cranston. Renata Sari and Michelle Birnbaum. Madam, Madam Commissioner and Commission members, 
My name is Jane Cranston, and I have lived in the Park Avenue Christian Church area for 25 years. I would like to share with you the number and diversity of people who agreed with your vote last year for landmarking Park Avenue, and now ask you to vote no at the proposed building plan. In 2013, almost 1,400 people signed the petition for landmarking. More than 200 letters were sent to the Landmarks Commission, and 16 letters were, were given to us in support of, from various political representatives. In 2014, we collected an additional 1,400, an additional 800 signatures and an additional 50 letters against the petition. This support came from buildings on Park Avenue, 37, stand up and show, please. They include 740, 812, 885, 929, 941, 969, 970, 975, 983, 993, 1000, 1001, 1020, 1021, 1025, 1035, 1036, 1040, 1049, 1065, 1070, 1088, 1100, 1105, 1111, and three buildings on 83rd Street, four buildings on 84th Street, and six on 85th Street. These signatures represent residents of buildings in the neighborhood, building employees, household staffs, professionals, parishioners, parents of children at the schools, block association members, merchants, and preservation associations. We respectfully ask you follow the vote of the Community Board 8 who disapproved this proposed plan by a 32 to 6 vote just last week. We ask you to vote no on the presented plan. And I thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Renata Sari. And then Michelle Bern Bernbaum. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm Renata Sari, and I'm reading a letter from Elaine Walsh, who is the East 86th Street uh, President of the Association. The East 86th Street Association, representing the residents and businesses from 80th Street to 93rd Street, from East End to Fifth Avenue, is in firm opposition to the development plans that Extel has presented to the Park Avenue Christian church site at 1010 Park Avenue. The height, scale, bulk, and glazing of the proposed building is not appropriate for this site. The Gothic art architecture of the church, its beautiful stonework, stained glass windows, and fletch are all dwarfed by the size and contrast of the proposed new building. We support Historic Park <coughs> Avenue in its request to alter these plans so as to maintain the existing parish house the facade and slate roof, set back the new building from the front facade, and not exceed the height of the existing structure. This will ensure that southern light will continue to pass through the stained glass windows of the church, and the beautiful fletch will be surrounded by sky on all sides. In addition, we are opposed to cutting to the north wall of the church in order to create an additional access for the handicapped. This would be a serious, unnecessary violation of a major facade that there is already full accessible street level double door entry on the western end of the north facade and additional handicap entry can also be accessed through the parish house. Please vote to disapprove of this plan as presented and encourage Bayer, Blinder and Bell to create an addition to this historic site that is in keeping with its position on the national register and is positioning on the historic district. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Bernbaum. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. I'm the president of Historic Park Avenue, the organization that filed the RFE for the Park Avenue Historic District from 79th to 86th Streets, and I wish to thank you very much for that designation. Historic Park Avenue also filed the RFE for designating the Park Avenue Christian Church Complex at 1010 Park, an individual landmark. We received the overwhelming support of residents, preservation organizations, community board eight, block associations, and others 
some of whom have positions at the museums, have nostalgic memories of the church and the nursery school, and some who come and go in our neighborhood but enjoy looking at this beautiful old church complex and seeing its steeple rise against a background of blue sky. Those letters and over a thousand signatures on petitions are in your records. That RFE not having been heard and the parish house having been designated no style left the community in shock as the argument that it is neo-Gothic structure is very strong and has been made by historians and others who have done the research. Because of that designation, we are before you today, and again, overwhelming support of our community and others who I've already mentioned to ask you to disapprove of the development plan that Extel has presented to this commission. You were wise enough to turn down their first plan involving a cantilever over the church looking like a big foot seeking to crush it. This newly proposed building is a big bully intimidating and overpowering its much smaller next door neighbor. You have again received hundreds of letters, petitions, and community board resolution, all in firm opposition to this plan. During a comment period at the time of the vote of the historic district, commissioners voiced their desires that the original portion of that front facade of the parish house, totaling almost half of the front facade of the proposed building, be incorporated into any new design. Since it would be awkward to leave 21 feet of the original facade and couple it with 24 feet of glass or limestone, it seems to me that the commissioners might like to see the entire front facade incorporated. The description of the existing building in your own designation report and in the New York Times at the time of the 60s construction is neo-Gothic, suggesting that any development on this site should maintain the entire front facade and its slate roof. It should be set back and not exceed the building's existing height so as to let the southern light into the church through its beautiful stained glass windows. Despite their rhetoric that they will not survive if this building were not build, we contend that this building does not have to be built to make the church viable. And while that issue is not before us, it is the only issue on which the church engages. If this were so, then a hardship hearing would be in order. Please vote down this proposal as the building is too large, too bulky, too overwhelming to the church, and completely inappropriate for the historic district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, may I also say, I have a, another minute, I have a bunch of letters from other residents and other buildings, and Margot Melniger, the uh, Vice President of the Board of 1040 Park, also submitted her, um, okay. her testimony. Thank, thank, you. thank you. The next speaker is Diane Hampton, then Mercedes Levin, and then Jum Rorimer. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. My name is actually Duane Hampton, but I know how difficult it is to get your head around that. Uh, on April 29th this year, those of us who had written and attended meetings and canvassed friends to support the landmarking at Park Avenue above 79th Street were delighted to hear that the Landmarks Commission approved extending its pro protection from 79th Street to 93rd Street. We all rejoiced. However, somehow, in the extended protection of Park Avenue, the diminutive and charming parish house of the Park Avenue Christian Church had been de designated a no-style building, still subject to possible development. I would suggest that the parish house does have a style, the Gothic style that everyone before me has mentioned. Its distinctive facade and peak slate roof set off the church it abuts, and its lower roof line works in conjunction with both the five-story Morris House 1015 Park Avenue, and the uh, DeCoven House 1025 across the street, to give the area a multi-level variety of architectural and history, historic flavor. As a neighbor said to me just yesterday, really these blocks are two, of, two and, or three of the prettiest blocks on Park Avenue. We, are in, the, the, we in these newly landmarked reaches of Park Avenue constitute a neighborhood of New Yorkers who live, work, study, play, shop and worship here. We cherish our neighborhood with its busy streets, avenues, and institutions full of urban history and contemporary activity. We inhabit a community that houses museums, schools, synagogues, churches, and businesses. Our neighborhood welcomes tourists from all over the globe who come to see that much heralded wonder of the, the much heralded wonders of the long fabled sweep of Park Avenue. These visitors very often come from communities and even whole countries whose own historic places have been ravaged by war or erased in a march to modernize. Whole cities and towns caught up in a race to create the new new at the expense of history and culture. 
Please don't let that happen here. Allow these blocks of Park Avenue to retain the character that makes them distinct, distinctive. Save the parish house. Stop the gratuitous creation of yet another tall apartment building that will disrupt the, disrupt the skyline and interrupt the light and calm of these upper reaches of our famous historic boulevard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mercedes Levin? Okay. Uh, James Rorimer? Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak here to the commission today and to represent uh, my family, which has lived in uh, that building, 1000 Park Avenue, for approximately 70 years. Um, the uh, architect used a word today that was monuments, and I'm the grandson of James Rormer, who was the monuments men and then later the director of the Met, and an expert on Gothic art history, so you can see why I'm here today. Um, my uh, personal opinion is something like, um, history doesn't repeat itself, but often it rhymes. So I brought with me a, a letter from Andrew Dolcart, Andrew Scott Dolcart, who I think you might know. Um, and it goes like this. Um, I'm writing regarding the application to build an apartment building on the lot immediately to the south of, park, of the Park Avenue Christian Church in the recently designated Park Avenue Historic District. I do not wish to comment on the specifics of the design proposed in the apartment house, but wish to make two points about the character of the district and the appropriateness of the building proposed. When the Park Avenue Dis Historic District was designated, the parish house and church located immediately to its south, south was found to be a no-style structure. The, and as an architectural historian and supporter of the Landmarks Commission who has been involved with the commission and its actions for over 30 years, I can state that this is one of the most indefensible decisions ever made by the commission since the building, partially designed by Bertram Goodhue in 1908 and partially rebuilt in 1962, is so clearly Gothic, uh, a Gothic style in inspiration. Because of the significance of the parish house uh, in relation to the church building, I think the commission could ask the architect and developer to propose a creative design for the apartment building such um, that would preserve the facade of the parish house. Although not ideal preservation solution, such a solution has been approved by the Landmarks Commission uh, for several projects, notably at, Cody and Rizzoli, at the Cody and Rizzoli site of Fifth Avenue and at the south, uh, south side of East 79th Street between Madison and Park Avenues. <coughs> Saving the front of the parish house and building behind it would preserve a sense of the evolving history of this important Park Avenue site. Even more significant than the preservation of the parish house is the preservation of Goodhue's magnificent church itself. Goodhue designed the church with three visible facades, all carefully finished in stone. The low-scale parish house not only permitted views towards the church from the south, but also permitted light to enter the church from this direction. Even when the church decided to build a taller building behind the parish house in 1962, it was carefully placed rear of the south end of the lot so as not to disturb the church building itself. The present plan for the apartment house completely obliterates any view of the important south facade. Scale, the scale hides the view of the beautiful flesh, and it will clearly have a negative impact on a significant feature in the Park Avenue Historic <laughs> District. Uh, the next speaker is Kathy Frank, then after that Margo S. Meldeker, and then Neil Ritter. Is Kathy Frank here? No. Okay. Margo S. Melnicker, Neil Ritter, is Neil Ritter here? All right, Steve Cass, Good afternoon, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Um, since time is limited, I'm going to be focused and I hope brief. Uh, others have commented uh, eloquently and in an informed way on the adverse effect of this uh, 
proposal on both the parish house facade, the scale of the uh, overall church complex, and its adverse effects on the church itself. Uh, I don't really need to repeat those comments, because, but they are compelling. Let me, do, let me say one other thing, however. Uh, it is not true that the commission found that the parish house facade was not a contributing element. What it found was that it had no style. But that doesn't mean it did not contribute in other ways. Frankly, the no style designation was calling uh, day, night, as I think, frankly, everyone in this room probably recognizes. But, but style and architectural style is only one of the factors that the Landmarks Commission has to consider in certificate of appropriateness proceedings. If you look at section 307, uh, which is the provision of the Landmarks Law relating to certificates of appropriateness, you will see that architectural style is one of a half a dozen factors. And those other factors bear directly on the role of the parish house and uh, its rear area in relationship to the church itself. The church has made a claim here that hardship is the issue. Others have already pointed out that, if there, that there is a procedure in the Landmarks Law, Section 309, for hardship applications. And in those applications, the church has to show, by the way, not that it can't make money, this is not a profit-making group, but that it can't use its property for its charitable purposes. There's been no showing of that, nor could there be. But if they wish to come in and show that, fine. Even then, they have to show that what they're doing is the minimum deviation, in your judgment, from that which is appropriate. There is no reason in the world why this commission should approve this certificate of appropriateness for this inappropriate building, with, and, and then why well, you should not require the applicant to come back with a new proposal. There are many alternatives that would work here. We believe there are alternatives that would generate tens of millions of dollars for the developer and tens of millions of dollars for the church and would still be uh, consistent and compatible with the sanctuary and the existing parish house. A low-scale building set back, consistent with the scale, would generate at current market rates I'm, I'm sorry, extraordinary value I'm sorry, your for the church. Up. Thank you very much for your attention. Sh uh, thank you. Sean Ofstein? And then after that, uh, Paul Vermeiler. Good afternoon. Vermeulen. Yes. I have lived on the Upper East Side for 18 years, and I strongly urge you to deny Extel's application to destroy Bertram Gridhue's parish house facade, whose form and style were sensitively retained in the 1960s renovation by Marilyn Holmgren. The applicant has asked this commission to conclude that the parish house is not worth saving. I would like to point out just a few reasons why so many of us think that is not the case. The entire church complex, including the parish house, is considered a contributing element of the National Register listed Park Avenue Historic District. The parish house is of landmark quality as the contextual changes to the historic facade and windows were made over 50 years ago. The contextual changes to the northern portion of the parish house continue to echo the Garthic architecture of the South Pavilion and the church. In spite of the no style designation, LPC's own designation report acknowledges that the reconstructed portions of the parish house facade are constructed in the Gothic Revival style. As Andrew Dolcart, Columbia University professor of historic preservation has noted, and I quote, the facade of the parish house employs blind arches, stone transom bars, leaded casement windows, buttresses at the entry, an oriel window, and other Gothic features. The very same features, he notes, are also found on the adjoining church. As Professor Dolcart has also pointed out, Marilyn Holmgren's sensitive 1960s renovation is historically remarkable because it is an early example of contextual design. The scale and setbacks of the parish house allow the church to be appreciated from almost every angle. 
It is clear to me that this commission understands these points and applies them in application to townhouse owners, cultural institutions, and churches all over the city. I can't imagine that this distinguished and respected commission would change course for this application, particular, particularly for the purpose of demolishing a property recognized on the National Register of Historic Places. We are counting on you, and we thank you. Thank you. Paul Vermeulen. And after that, Chris Rizzo and Karen Mira. My name is Paul Vermillon. I've been a resident of 1000 Park for six years. <clears throat> I've been asked to read a wonderful letter uh, by the uh, president of the co-op board at 1020 Park, but I am not going to do that in the interest of time. You have the letter. It covers a petition signed by 36 people. You also have my letter. I just want to make one point. 52 years ago, this wonderful church and its then sensitive overseers planned a complex and an annex that respected the parish house, uh, if not in its entirety, in its form, and in the role that it played in presenting the church to the city. Uh, how ironic it would be, all the laws have been passed, all of the boards created, the commissions created, in the last 52 years for this commission to fail to respect the wisdom of Park Avenue Christian. Thank you. Thank you. The next person, Chris Frizzo. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Frizzo, and my law firm represents residents of 1000 Park Avenue. I've been asked today to address a particular issue in regard to this application, which is demolition of landmarks. This commission has allowed the demolition of a landmark on only a handful of occasions in the past decade, particularly a landmark which is both a city landmark and a state and national register landmark. In doing so, it has set a very high standard for demolition. Two examples are worth noting. Number one, on March 27, 2014, this commission approved the demolition of 233 Mott Street, which is part of the St. Patrick's Church complex in Soho. In approving the demolition, the commission made two findings. Number one, that the structure to be demolished was built entirely in 1954 and lacked a design relationship to the rest of the campus. Number two, that the replacement structure would have a height and scale, quote, consistent with other buildings in the complex. Another example is worth noting. On May 16, 2008, the commission approved the demolition of 175 Ninth Avenue, which is part of the General Theological Seminary. In approving the demolition, the commission made the same two findings. First, the existing building dated entirely from the 1960s and lacked, lacked any architectural relationship to the rest of the seminary campus. Number two, that the five-story base and two-story setback of the replacement will mediate between the low scale of the buildings on the rest of the campus and the tall apartment buildings on Ninth Avenue. I can think of perhaps two other examples from the past decade where the landmark was, demo was demolished and the same two findings were made. Neither of those two findings can be made in the present case. As both the National Register and City Reports recognize, the parish house has a carefully designed Gothic front and a low scale. Extel's proposal would erase these two qualities with a modern high rise. Approval of this kind of application sets a new low standard for demolition of a landmark and an even lower standard for a replacement of a landmark. I therefore encourage this commission to deny the present application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Mira. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. I'm Karen Mira, and with my colleagues, Steve Cass and Chris Rizzo, I represent uh, 1000 Park. Um, I just want to comment briefly on, uh, on the administrative code. I mean, the question we're here to answer is, is this proposal appropriate? And the administrative code lays out some standards that you are to consider in making this determination. The first thing you're supposed to consider is the effect it would have on the exterior architectural features of the existing improvement, the improvement that is proposed to be changed. So if you look at the, your own designation report, there are quite a few uh, significant architectural features referenced in that report on 
the, not only on the church, but the parish house itself. For example, significant architectural features include asymmetrical field stone facade with cross gable, and the, the report specifically references not only the uh, 1910 portion, but also the rebuilt portion in the 1960s. Uh, double entrance with full surround, that's the 1960s doorway with the Gothic surround. Windows with keyed surrounds. The, the designation report also references special windows that would be destroyed uh, by the proposal. The Oriel window, which many have mentioned, and also the leaded glass casement windows with transoms. The other question that the commission is to ask itself in, in weighing whether a proposal is appropriate is the relationship between the results of the proposal and the exterior architectural features of neighboring improvements. And of course, many have already spoken about the church and 1000 Parks Gothic features uh, and, and other features within the district. I just want to mention, though, that the report is very clear um, that one of the most significant features of the church is the 70-foot-tall lead flesh that was cast in Birmingham, England by Henry Pope and Sons, in which echoes the Saint chapelle And it, it can't be disputed that erecting this proposal will change the views of that significant feature. It'll completely block it from the south and east, and from the north, many of the views will be compromised uh, certain views, it will be lost against the background of the building, and other views, as in this rendering here, it will be the, the sky, uh, it's very close to the edge of the other building. Finally, I just want to mention that the designation report describes, uh, in describing the character of the district, speaks about uh, that the district contains two important religious complexes. This proposal would, of course... I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there are three more speakers, Lil Van Der Vaak, Mark Goldstein, and uh, Mary C. Davidson. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lil Van Der Vaak. I'm representing Carnegie Hill Neighbors. We, uh, we, we supplied the... Uh, the uh, the basis for 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 the historic district above 86th Street to 91st. Uh, we agree that the preferred solution for the annex portion of the site would involve an addition of modest height, including the historically intact southern cross gable bay and the contours of the pitched roof facing Park Avenue. We recognize that the identification of no style for the annex in the designation report makes this alternative uh, high, very difficult to achieve. We would support a reconsideration of the no style designation suggested by friends and others. Faced with the evaluation of the current proposal, we urge the commission not to approve the 16-story apartment building designed by Bayer Blender Bell to replace the church annex. While the design has much to commend it, it is not appropriate for this site. It is too tall, overwhelming both the church and the other apartment building of the block. The proposed design also fails to incorporate parts of the intact historic fabric of the annex, especially the cross-gabled bay facing Park Avenue. The possibility of doing this was mentioned by several commissioners at the April 29 uh, hearing for the designation of the district. A major shortcoming of the current design is that it fails to show spatial deference, deference to the church in its historic setting by overwhelming it by the combination of its height and its close proximity. The proposed building abuts the church so closely that it diminishes the church's visibility and prominence. Two transitional elements or adjustments could be introduced. One is the setback already suggested from Park Avenue, and the other would be a setback on the side of the building facing the church, or some kind of an indentation, creating greater space between the church and, 
and the ap ap apartment building and allowing for greater visibility and prominence of the church. Uh, finally, we think, we think that the f there should be a mechanism to channel the funds appropriately to maintain the building in perpetuity. 74711 might provide that vehicle. And if, there, if we are set back from the street wall, we would need a variance, and that could trigger 74711. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mark Goldstein? Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chairman, Chairwoman, and uh, the commissioners uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, I had some prepared remarks. I think everybody's covered everything that needs to be said about that. And so I'm going to try to address the discussion in a slightly different, more basic manner. I am very sympathetic to what the commission has to deal with. You've got a series of competing interests. You've got the church that is, I guess, we can assume that the church is running low on funds, although some people say we should go through a hardship proceeding. I'm not knowledgeable about that. Let's just leave that aside. But the church is asserting that it has no funds. And so it needs to go sell this piece of property to be developed. You've got a developer who wants to maximize his revenue and his economic outcome. You've got the competing interest of the preservation community who thinks that any destruction of the parish house is not in accordance with what they think would be the right thing to do to preserve Park Avenue. And so the question becomes, what does the commission do? And I, you know, I would say to you, I'm very sympathetic to the plight of, gee whiz, I got a bunch of competing interests, but this really isn't all that complicated, okay? The church can obtain a sufficient amount of funds to continue for a very, very long period of time if it were to build a building that were smaller, set back, smaller footprint. And by that means, while Mr. Barnett will make not as much money as if you permit him to build what's on the screen, I don't think anybody here is feeling too sorry for Gary Barnett right about now, right? He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And sometimes deals go well, and sometimes deals don't go precisely as planned. And if this thing winds up being that he can't build a 16-story tower and he needs to build a six-story tower, you know, I just don't think we're breaking out the violin for Gary Barnett. I just don't think we are gonna go do that. So the simple solution is to reject the application. Let's go back to square one and say to Mr. Barnett, you know, there's a lot of competing interests here. Can you make a proposal of a building that's six stories in height so that the church isn't diminished? It's set back so that we can preserve the front of the parish house and its, and its roof. And this way, you'll get some plaudits from the community of conservationists and preservationists. The church will get its money. You'll make, instead of hundreds of millions of dollars, you'll make tens of millions of dollars and everybody can go home happy. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Mar Mary Davidson? Mary Davidson? Uh, OK, are there any more speakers on this item? Any more speakers? All right, I just want to note uh, that we have also received a significant amount of testimony that will be submitted into the record, and any of the commissioners would like to see it, we have it on record. And we did receive a letter from, um, from Municipal Art Society, which I'm not going to read out here. They really haven't commented. More than note that they believe that the rectory does have a style and could have been described as neo-Gothic, but uh, they understand that that was already established through a designation report. Uh, but they have raised some concerns about uh, the, the design of the building. We will make um, copies of this and give it to all the commissioners so they can have it and review it. All right. Uh, uh, no, it, it will not. We, we will decide and, and we'll let you know. Okay. All right. Yes. Mr. Selver, please. We have a very, very short time to, to clarify a couple of things. Okay. All right, but, uh, what I suggest is uh, two things. In, in uh, the interest of time, uh, we'll allow you to respond back, but I think the commission should have its full discussion on a subsequent date. 
Um, I know some of the commissioners have to leave. I think uh, we would benefit as a group if, in fact, uh, all of us are here. So two commissioners have to leave in a few minutes. But if you'd like to respond now or if you want to make a... F I know. We're, we're, we're okay. You're okay. So, in fact, what we'll do, uh, and uh, obviously we've received a lot of testimony here, and if I can sort of broadly uh, identify certain issues that have come out. One is, of course, uh, an issue about uh, the existing um, rectory itself. Uh, I think the question that's been raised about redesignating that piece and determining a different style and something different from our, uh, uh, the designation report, uh, I think is not really on the table. That was already determined by the commission. It uh, went through a full public review process. The commission acted on that, and uh, so did the city council. So recommendations that we should rethink that part, I believe, is not on the table. Uh, other aspects about uh, the remnant and its incorporation into uh, a new design is something that uh, has come up again and again, and I think the applicants should speak to that issue. I think the other aspects have to do with the scale and form of this building, so there's the issues of the facade itself, but also about the height and uh, the massing. Uh, there are issues that were raised about the relationship of the tower vis-a-vis -vis the church and that, um, that connection, which I think is still unresolved, and we'd like you to look at that. Um, there were some suggestions about setting the building back, both from the front and from the side, that you should explore and come back to us and explain uh, what that would mean to your design and, uh, and uh, appropriateness. Um, and I think there were a few other issues that were raised. Uh, one was about it's partly related to the setbacks, but about light into the the church and the sanctuary and your response to that. And uh, if I can remember the last one, and maybe the others, of course, uh, but uh, the issue of uh, the entrance itself, which is the ADA-compliant entrance, uh, its particular location, if there are other locations as well, and why that's appropriate where it is. Um, is there anything else that... Uh, yeah. fenestration, oh. fenestration as well, I think. Yes, so the design of the building, the fenestration, so the facades itself, the treatment of fenestration, and I think a sort of issue or a question about the style of this building vis-a-vis -vis more Art Deco versus, I think, uh, the predominant type of materials and style of the apartment buildings and how you would uh, respond to that as well. Uh, I think there are questions that were raised about hardship case that is Again, I would say it's not on the table. While the applicants have um, made arguments that include, uh, I think, a general need for, uh, for the congregation and receiving uh, uh, some uh, benefits with the ability to build this, uh, this building. However, I think the commission will still look at what the factors are regarding appropriateness, and that will be our determining factor. Yes, Michael? So one, other, one other point that I thought was an interesting one raised by some of the testimony was, dis whatever the designation of the uh, annex may be, certainly views of landmark buildings is always considered by the commission. So I think that the, the, um, some of the issues raised by, by some of the testimony about views from the south of the building and of aspects of the building should be addressed in as well. Okay, all right. Uh, are there any other questions right now? Uh, what we will do is we will um, we will close the public hearing in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, speaking into the record, uh, but we'll leave it open for any uh, additional written testimony. Okay. So uh, yes, uh, Mark, do you want to add anything, please? Okay, all right. Uh, yes, Roberta. Are they presenting? Are we starting where we left off? And that we are giving our time to do this? Are they I'm sorry. All right, just uh, to note that we'll leave the record open for written testimony for two weeks. And uh, to answer your question, Roberta, uh, I think. Obviously, we have a lot to digest as well. We will allow them to come in, and 
uh, respond to the testimony they've heard to, uh, today, as well as uh, what we've sort of identified as some of the issues, and then we can uh, continue to discuss uh, various aspects. The expectation that we're going to talk about this scheme, they're not going to they're not going to go back and redo it. Well, I think, uh, let me just say one thing, that uh, they can. I think there were certain aspects that were identified as design issues, and uh, they should look at that. Their expectation is that they would have made whatever changes they... Let me just say one thing, that since uh, the, the commission hasn't really determined which way they should go, so uh, I think what we're asking them to do is look at it, they can look at it, they can see whether they want to incorporate that, but I think we'd like to know what the response is when we come back. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience. And we will close the hearing.